वेलकम एड्रेस गुड आफ्टरनून आई वेलकम एवरी वन हियर इन दॉल एंड ऑनलाइन ऑल डेलीगेट्स फैकल्टी to this meeting on update on fetal growth restriction and this uh, cme is organized under the aegis of uh, society of fetal medicine delhi chapter and uh, aogd uh, fetal medicine and genetics committee thank you welcome everyone thank you ma'am um, this particular update is very very uh, special because uh, it's a a uh, very interesting uh, meeting it's been organized by two very very active societies we have great speakers um, who have who are legends in their own fields and uh, the topic is so relevant and very very important for all of us uh, this has been a brainchild of um, you know this has been uh, of uh, has been guided by none other than uh, dr ashok khurana who you all know is the mentor emeritus of society of fetal medicine he is a world renowned uh, fetal medicine person and to begin this conference i would first like to invite him to say a few words thank you thank you very much for those kind word it's uh, a pleasure to be here today we always find fetal growth restriction very very restricting because we hear new concepts and then we have to go back to old concepts and somebody comes up with a new concept and we think okay maybe that's better and then we realize that we still don't have answers so we need to constantly update ourselves the other thing we realize is that the more the practicing obstetrician gets into fetal growth restriction and its intelligent management we do understand that it no longer remains the realm of a single person and that we do need collaboration between clinicians we need collaboration between technology and clinicians and we need collaboration between ourselves to make sure that every fetus gets an optimal outcome and so i'm so pleased that we've got together here today the society of fetal medicine the uh, delhi chapter the um, uh, in the association of gynecologists of delhi uh, getting together through their fetal medicine committee as well as uh, the all in institute of medical sciences our premier institute uh, in india delhi leading the way and that we are all going to talk about the same thing our international speakers today are two ends of the spectrum which is very nice we have conventional wisdom and we have uh, age and experience and then we have at the end of the session after we've had a panel discussion in between a completely new look where we do realize that expertise is uh, very little Uh, that a lot of us who handle um, the uh, the ground realities don't have the experience to make wise decisions, and that perhaps an a computer based, app based approach might be more appropriate because it combines the wisdom of what everybody else has seen and makes up for what we don't have through experience and wisdom. So I'm truly looking forward to this, and thank you so much to the department here. Thank you so much to. Dr. Vatsala Dadwal and Dr. Aparna Sharma for putting this together, and I'm so glad Dr. Kamal Gujral is leading the way to make sure that we repeat these frequently enough. What we've also done today is to make sure that this is hybrid. We do understand that in Delhi the conditions are completely chaotic to get to anywhere on time. We do understand that there's uh, so much of a demand to listen to this. We would be receiving endless um, uh, inquiries on. whether people can watch a recording of this well there will be a recording of this which will go on to our youtube channel as you know the society of fetal medicine youtube channel and will be free for everyone to access but most importantly for those of you who are sitting in uh, the in, in the comfort of their own clinics and homes uh, here we are uh, right there live and uh, there for you and thank you so much for including me on this program thank you thank you very much sir as always um, we also have with us dr bimal sahani sir who is the president of uh, society of fetal medicine india sir is a very uh, active academician and he is also very passionate about taking the uh, work of the society of fetal medicine to all the corners of the country so uh, dr bimal sir we'd like to hear a few words from you 
Yeah, thank you, Aparna, and uh, I really want to congratulate. So you need to unmute. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Uh, excuse me. You need to. Can you hear me? The, we need to get a volume from there. Hello. Can you hear me now? Hello, Aparna, can you hear me? Sir, um, Bujral, ma'am, can you speak? Uh, is there a problem with our system or? Ma'am, can you unmute? Dr. Bujral, ma'am, can you unmute? We checked the system. Dr. Bujral, ma'am? So, uh, what happened? Yeah, Aparna, we could hear Dr. Vimal very well, you know. We could see him as well as hear him. Can you hear me, Aparna? Now you're unmute. Can you talk? Yeah, I'm talking. Okay. You can't hear me. So, uh, in the meantime, while we're just sorting it out, I'll just request, uh, we also have with us, because this is an organi being organized by Society of Fetal Medicine and AOGD, and we have with us Dr. Asmita here. Uh, can I request, we'll just sort the Zoom out. Can I request Dr. Asmita ma'am to say a few words? Dr. Asmita Ma'am is the president of AOGD and she is also the head of the department of Maulana Azad Medical College. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aparna. I think at the outset, I would congratulate Team AIMS, uh, Dr. Nirja, Dr. Aparna, Dr. Vatsala, Society of Fetal Medicine Delhi chapter for organizing CME on this important topic. Fetal growth restriction is a very common clinical condition which we all obstetricians deal with. Dilemmas in diagnosis, updates, new charts, which charts to use, customized, population-based, and so on. Some new things coming every time, so we all need an update. And I think the legions participating as a faculty in this uh, update, it's going to be a great learning for all of us. Thank you so much for making AOGD part of it. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, can we have the speakers now? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Now we can. Now we can, sir. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I just, I need, you know, I want to congratulate the team of uh, the Society of Fetal Medicine Delhi chapter and the OBGY Society Delhi for, and of course, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences for uh, putting up a meeting of this high academic magnitude, uh, having uh, the two you know, huge authorities on a subject of fetal growth restriction, which we know for India, which you know, has one of a very, very high prevalence in India and having these two people together on, us, on the same platform and organizing something of this magnitude I congratulate you and uh, I'm really, really, really happy that the Society of Fetal Medicine is uh, doing this and really thank you for making it hybrid so that uh, all over the country, you know, everyone who's interested in fetal growth restriction uh, is able to join and listen to these stalwarts. Thank you very much and thank you for making me a part of this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your words. And uh, we have with us Dr. Seema Thakur, ma'am, who's uh, the uh, chairperson of the Genetics and Fetal Medicine Committee, who's been encouraging us to do all of this work. So, Dr. Seema Thakur, ma'am. So, 
so on behalf of our uh, subcommittee i would welcome i would like to welcome all the faculty and the delegates indeed the topic is very very important and this is important from the perspective of the day to day practice so very commonly we are encountering this and the uh, the management uh, depends upon you know how we can diagnose it in the in well ahead in the time and also there are very few you know the how when to deliver is the most important thing which we want to understand because so that so as to avoid the atrogenic preterm delivery and uh, the you know the consequences of this so with these few words you know i welcome you all thank you thank you ma'am so now uh, we move on to the session uh, yeah so ma'am uh, dr gujral ma'am can you uh, unmute yourself now is it working for you now can you hear me yes ma'am loud uh, yeah fine am i heard yes ma'am yes yeah. Yes, fine. Then we start the session. And uh, do I start it, Asmita? Would you like to start it? Uh, so, ma'am, uh, can I just uh, just take a minute here? Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Kamal Gujral, ma'am, uh, to the first session here. So, I would like to invite the chairpersons, uh, ma'am. I can request Dr. Asmita, ma'am, here. Dr. Asmita, yes. So, Dr. Asmita, ma'am, as we've just introduced, she is the uh, president of AOGD and also the head of the department at uh, obstetrics and gynecology at Maulana Azad Medical College. Dr. Kaval Gujral, ma'am, is a senior consultant at uh, Gangaram Hospital and uh, uh, a practicing obstetrician. Uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Anu Pukral, who's an additional professor in the division of neonatology at AIMS. And it is our privilege to have uh, these three uh, very senior people uh, leading this uh, session here. And I would like to request them to take the session forward. So Dr. Kamal Gujral, ma'am. Okay, I'll start the session. Thank you, Aparna, and thank you, everyone. And I would say that to start a fetal growth restriction, it's so appropriate for us to know how to diagnose it, which growth chart to follow, population, customize, and you got the master to give up. Uh, talk. Dr. Jason got the slide. Please introduce him on the slide. And I would say on a personal note, Dr. Kajosi, I followed your articles. Last night, I revised your 2018 AGOG on customization of growth curves. It is an excellent read and I request all the members who have logged in, please read his review article on customization of growth uh, uh, charts and the perinatal outcomes. Excellent. Waiting to hear you with 600 more people logged in. Professor Jason Gaudosi, all yours. Can we have him? Can you please unmute him or something? Aparna, where is the glitch? Okay, thank you for allowing me to unmute. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you, Professor. And um, you can hear me okay now? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Uh, so I'm very pleased to um, be here or there. Um, the wonders of virtual meetings. And, uh, and I'm particularly pleased that um, uh, this is a multidisciplinary meeting as well, because what we're talking about is, of course, uh, important for the whole perinatal period. So I'm going to um, start sharing my slides. And I hope you can see that okay now. Yes? Uh, we can see that, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, so um, essentially, in this uh, half hour or so, uh, I want to talk about fatal growth charts and the role in preventing adverse uh, perinatal outcome. And I want to start with a declaration of interest that I work for the Perinatal Institute, a not-for-profit social enterprise 
which provides training and tools that I discuss in this presentation. But also on our website, I would invite you to, uh, uh, after the meeting, to go to some of the present, some of the uh, papers that are relevant to this uh, presentation, um, uh, including a recent one where we've sort of uh, reviewed uh, the latest uh, um, uh, evidence uh, on uh, the work that we're doing. So our story on stillbirths and their prevention started in the West Midlands in England, which had one of the highest stillbirth rates in the U United Kingdom and in fact in Western Europe. We are undertook a large series of confidential anonymized case reviews to understand the causes and we kept coming across intrauterine growth restriction as the most frequent precursor of uh, uh, stillbirths. Another problem was in our uh, population that the classification system that was used at that time um, uh, classified most cases as unexplained. I'm just going to use my pointer here. Whereas when we then introduced a classification system, which also includes SGA, by customized centers as a category, not necessarily a cause, but a relevant condition, then that then became the uh, largest component of the pie. And in fact, it was uh, the uh, classification for most hitherto unexplained cases. And then a study of maternal and fetal risk factors found that SG was, um, when it was in uh, present in utero um, uh, represented a sevenfold increased risk of dying. When it was not recognized, then it was twice as high than when it was recognized antenatally. <clears throat> but also important here is that most of these were late onset, so therefore the actual difference in gestational age was only about 10 days earlier. So we did, did not fill up the neonatal unit with uh, preterm babies by recognizing in most cases of antenatal uh, growth restriction. So case reviews, stillbirth classification and epidemiology. Uh, we had evidence from which essentially led to fatal growth restriction being a frequent precursor of stillbirth, hence potentially avoidable better detection of growth restriction will allow further investigation and timely delivery. So we devised what we call the fetal growth surveillance program, which includes history, identification of risk factors, serial fundal height measurement, serial ultrasound biometry, biophysical assessment of do uh, Doppler, and monitoring, very importantly, monitoring performance, including the rate of antenatal detection of SG. And of course, you are all familiar with this, but it's important to actually just um, go through it because this then became what we call the growth assessment protocol. And for an algorithm for management, we took the best bits of various different uh, protocols that are out there and devised one, which I won't go in detail, but just outlining the main elements of it as part of the GAP program, which is, of course, starting with risk assessment at the beginning of preg pregnancy. If low risk, then um, a serial assessment by fundal height measurement. Um, fundal height measurement needs to be standardized. It is not gestational age equals cent centimeter and requires serial measurement. <coughs> Excuse me plotting on customized charts and clear referral pathways. <clears throat> so even the usual name, symphysis fundal height is wrong because of course you need to start from the variable point, which is the fundus. And um, with both hands, then you identify the fundus and take the tape measure down to the uh, first hard point you can come across, which is of course the symphysis pubis and um, uh, you measure in centimeters and you plot it. And you plot it on a customized chart adjusted for that individual. And when <clears throat> there's slowing of growth, um, you refer for ultrasound scan. In this case, was less than third centile, 
the baby was delivered safely. And as the midwives and the obstetricians said, they knew that they saved this particular baby. And that just gives more confidence for how to manage when fetal growth does not grow, uh, is not, not progressing well. If you cannot do fundal height measurements, uh, for example, high BMI or um, uh, multiple fibroids, or of course, multiple pregnancy, then the recommendation is um, serial assessment um, of growth from about 28 weeks onwards, every, preferably every three weeks, um, three to four weeks. If there is increased risk, then uh, an early assessment in our practice, of course, I'm sure you appreciate uh, much of low risk care is by a midwifery team out in the community. But uh, if there are risk factors, then review by uh, an obstetrician if uh, the case can be managed by serial assessment of fundal height, then that's fine. If it is a fetal maternal case, then uh, needs a referral to the fetal maternal medicine unit. Serial ultrasound biometry is important. It's an important component after recognition, either at the beginning of pregnancy or during pregnancy, that there are the risks of uh, um, uh, uh, growth restriction and or stillbirth. And we looked at this in terms of what happens if serial scanning is not afforded for whatever reason. And uh, we looked at this in 1.3 million births in 119 UK hospitals that the GAP program is uh, running in now. And so uh, at-risk pregnancies have got increased uh, risk of stillbirth. If they have serial scans, it's less, but importantly, if they don't, have serial scans, then the risk is twice as high. And then, of course, as you move on, you get to the term, and I will not go into detail here, and I think my colleague, uh, Professor Grotakos, I think will cover some of that, but when you get to the um, to term, um, we actually follow the Barcelona protocol, or uh, mostly, and there the considerations is uh, when uh, the, uh, the pregnancy is low risk on assessment, normal fungal height measurements, normal growth velocity, and normal doctors, if they have been done, then expectant management. If um, the baby is seriously uh, small, less than third centile, has lower static growth or abnormal uh, doppler's, in particular, um, uh, cerebral percentile ratio at term, then aim to deliver at 37 weeks or earlier. And if in between, so for example, third to the 10th centile, but with normal growth uh, velocity and normal Dopplers, then you can wait until 39 weeks. Um, so then uh, we, I, I won't talk about uh, Doppler, but it's of course a very important component of the assessment, not just biometry, but by physical assessment as required. And then very importantly, monitoring performance and the rate of antenatal detection of SG is a key performance indicator that is essential. So whenever, before we implement the GAP program in any site, we encourage the unit to perform a baseline um, audit to look at the detection rate that they have currently. In other words, what proportion of SG babies are um, recognized as such antenatally. And usually it's around about uh, 15 to 20%, maybe a little bit more than 20% a bit, but it's quite consistent. And then as soon as implemented, the detection rate jumps to about three to four times that much. Um, in, that's the general average, the overall average. And this is what we call the top 10 in the country. And they're the ones that implement the full protocol and they audit their performance and so on. And we had a dip here um, recently, which we ascribed to the height of COVID when antenatal care was essentially impossible. And then we also have detection rate by less than third centile and there the detection rate is higher. As you can see about 61% uh, on average in the country and then our top 10 is about 80%. Now, we'll issue reports for benchmarking, which is uh, uh, very important for um, 
units to sort of see where they are at. And they can see as part and parcel of the uh, program uh, where they are in terms of their particular unit in terms of antenatal detection, how that compares with the national average and how that compares with the top 10 to uh, illustrate what can be done, which is, I think, quite uh, often uh, motivating. And then also very importantly, the review of missed cases. So if the baby was not detected antenatally, why? What was the herb? Was it access to ultrasound? Was it uh, lack of training? And very often we find system issues that can be identified in this way. So over the last um, uh, 10 or so years, um, we found that there was a, a gradual year on year reduction of stillbirth rates in England. Um, by 28%, which represents a th over 1,000 uh, fewer babies dying each year. There was a bit of flattening and through to COVID, and I think the latest uh, figures show a little bit of increase here as well, which we need to investigate further. But this was associated with, firstly, regional implementation of GAP and then national implementation. And we looked at this in terms of um, uh, how a, a national office of national statistic data. Um, and we grouped uh, all the units in England into four categories. The quarter or so that are not in GAP program still haven't uh, um, been convinced uh, to, to join for various reasons, um, different uh, priorities perhaps, different research projects as well. Uh, those that are in GAP, but only partially implemented, no audits, no, uh, uh, not following protocols, but uh, using charts. And in GAP, complete implementation, and in GAP, the top 20. So those were the, the four categories. And we published this not long ago. And we found that, first of all, there was a reduction also in the non-GAP units. Um, and we felt that this was particularly the case. This is over the three-year moving average from um, uh, actually 2008, so three-year moving average from 2010 to 2017. Um, and uh, we feel that this drop started really uh, due to the uh, beneficial effects of the RCOG guidelines that recommended um, improved um, antenatal uh, uh, risk assessment and importantly um, serial scanning in a high risk pregnancy, which we think is uh, really uh, quite important once you recognize that that pregnancy needs to be monitored all the way through. Partial implementation of GAP did not um, show a um, significant difference. Complete implementation did, it, it was a steeper downward curve and the top 20 um, even more so. And so this was what we regard as a dose response relationship and uh, contributes to the thinking that this is a causal association um, in this uh, uh, observational study. So we have about um, three quarters of sites in the United Kingdom in the GAP program, but increasingly also um, we're working with um, interested champions in different countries and of course also in India. You may have seen this publication earlier this year from the Fernandes Hospital um, where they did a, um, an assessment, uh, a longitudinal study in uh, the Fernandes Hospital in Hyderabad of uh, detection and stillbirth rates and neonatal outcomes. And this was led by Dr. Nusad Aziz uh, as well as Dr. Pallavi Chandra, who uh, were leading this project um, at the Fernandez Hospital. What's in interesting to see is that we adapted based on their own data, their own uh, um, <clears throat> population, the customized charts, and it was actually running at a, around about 10% SGA rate. So uh, I'll talk a minute about what happens if you don't uh, adjust um, for uh, your local population and customize also for maternal um, height and weight. So initially there was a um, 
Um, this was their baseline detection rate as a tertiary unit. It was already running at quite a good rate. Um, this was during implementation and embedding of uh, GAP, and then a significant increase once GAP was running uh, of antenatal detection rate. And the effect of st on stillbirth rates um, compared to the uh, pre-GAP and the post-GAP period showed that there was a significant reduction of term stillbirths. And, um, and in comparison of uh, in terms of neonatal outcomes, there was a significant reduction of admissions to NICU, as well as a um, reduction of incidence of neonatal encephalopathy. So um, <clears throat> central to growth surveillance is the customized chart. And this is uh, something that is a, it's a combined chart for uh, the growth curve, as well as the birth rate. It's a perinatal chart rather than, and I'll get to it a bit later in terms of what the effect of it is if you have two different standards. It starts by identifying uh, a term optimal weight based on maternal characteristics. Um, and then from there, you draw a proportionality curve based on the original Hadlock fatal weight curve. But essentially it just says it takes this point predicted by the computer based on all the coefficients of the variables, and then combines that, that then becomes 100%. And this explains how does this term optimal weight get reached in a normal pregnancy. So the variables that we exclude from a, um, a whenever we analyze a database is anything that relates to pathology, as shown here, including preterm deliveries, and we adjust for maternal height, weight in early pregnancy, parity, and ethnic origin. So we have these, these differences uh, result in different expectations of the term optimal weight. So then the growth chart is customized for each mother's characteristics. So here's the term optimal weight again. We draw through that uh, the, the uh, proportionality curve to explain and not just how the baby is to get there, but also um, what, where, what the birth weight is once the baby is delivered. So here an example of this mother uh, with these characteristics has got a term optimal weight calculated as 3.7 kilograms. And this mother with these characteristics is 3.1 kilograms. Now, what happens if you, if you have the same measurements, say 2,500 grams at 37 weeks, have completely different connotations for this mother. If she has uh, uh, this chart, a normal chart or, or a population-based chart, not adjusted for her characteristics, you can see that for her, this is a, a small for gestational age baby. And for this mother, um, if it's adjusted for her, then this uh, measurement is uh, right uh, where it should be and should be reassuring. But what happens if you now look at, um, if you turn the mothers around and you manage this mother with this uh, uh, a population based or chart or chart for a larger mother, you can see that you cause unnecessary anxiety. And for this mother, if you manage her with a uh, chart uh, which was meant for this mother, then of course uh, you miss the fact that this uh, 2,500 grams at 37 weeks is not quite right for her and requires referral. So we did a study in terms of the, um, the number of false positives that we're getting uh, if we're uh, using a headlock curve for um, mothers from uh, South Asia in our population. And we found that in fact, that applies to 56% of uh, mothers who are having a scan in the third trimester are um, uh, considered to be um, excessively uh, considered SGA if they are um, measured by Hadlock rather than a customized chart. And these mothers who are reclassified did, were small normal because they did not have an increased risk of perinatal mortality, as you can see here from the relative risk and the confidence interval. 
So ethnic specific chasts um, have been studied in a number of uh, different uh, uh, parts of the world, and uh, they're found to have better concordance with perinatal mortality. So here's the question, does one size fits all? The concordance of perinatal mortality and SGA rates were based on ethnic specific standards, a strong case for ethnic specific charts. Here is another study, I think it was from um, uh, Washington State, uh, looking at neonatal outcomes and found that um, it is, um, uh, that there is uh, ethnic variation um, uh, associated with uh, adverse outcome and that uh, one should use ethnic specific charts. Uh, here, uh, Greg Alexander and Robert Goldenberg's group looked at extremely low risk populations in the US and found that um, these uh, racial differences um, exist. And uh, the reason why this is important is because um, very often people, and certainly in many Western countries, mix up racial or ethnic differences with um, uh, differences in social um, deprivation and so on. And that of course is not the case, but, uh, it can be the case, but in uh, most instances, ethnic variation is a constitutional factor when you look at um, uh, normal growth. And here uh, from the NICHT, um, um, Professor Grantz's uh, group found different uh, ethnic curves in their low risk population um, for the different ethnicities there. Then there, uh, so one of the main uh, things about customizing is that it reduces false positive diagnosis of fatal growth restriction. Um, and uh, we also found uh, that uh, there are, it picks up, better picks up at risk pregnancies. And there are a number of studies in different environments that have shown that. More recently, um, uh, Nia Malamed and uh, Professor Kingdom um, uh, looked at placental. Um, uh, pathology and found that customized centers perform better than their Canadian population standard. And then there's, of course, integrals. And uh, I understand that <laughs> integrals charts are being used a lot. In, um, in, uh, now in India, they're freely available. So, uh, but when you actually look at the evidence, I mean, they started by saying that it's, uh, it is uh, claimed that uh, it was similar in all different populations and um, that uh, uh, one size can uh, serve all environments. And of course that was opposed or contradicted by the other study, WHO study, Kizaru et al. that showed um, even though they produced the standard, they, they um, said that um, there were significant differences in growth and estimated fatal weight between countries and fatal growth charts may need to be adjusted to fit the diversity of individuals and populations. Because that is actually also uh, visible in the intergrowth um, projects on publications. So here you have the um, term birth weights um, between India 2.9 and uh, UK 3.5 and the average for all that population 3.3, that's a, huge difference when you sort of look at um, how this would affect. So here's, for example, way back in 95, we um, published on our own population and that included uh, three main groups, um, Indian, um, Pakistani were the sort of uh, ones on the left there. And if you draw a line to designate SG for one population, it means something completely different for the other. And that is one of the main issues there when you sort of try to identify extremes. And when, what happens there then can be actually quite extreme. So here is the CHURG group had a large data set and they applied their integral standard um, to uh, their data set. And they found that um, they had SG rates of 34% in the uh, South Asian cohort that they had. So how can you work with something like that? Um, here's uh, another, uh, 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 the, the issue there of course, is that you are um, 
you are uh, essentially labeling all um, uh, a large proportion of mothers as having SJ babies, you increase anxiety, you overload the health service. And um, more uh, also just as importantly, you will not take seriously anymore when a baby is SGA. Here's another study looking at hypertense, um, chronic hypertension uh, cases, that uh, there was a higher sensitivity in identifying um, nine, um, at risk uh, due to neonatal unit, identified as neonatal unit admission uh, uh, in customized grow charts compared to um, integral charts. And uh, here uh, it was applied in Australia to preterm um, gestations and found that the group customized classified a greater number than um, integrals of um, uh, increased risk of perinatal mortality compared to integrals. Um, here uh, is evidence from a multi-ethnic population in New Zealand. And then our 10 country, 1.2 million births uh, analysis, uh, where we looked at um, SGA by GROW uh, overall. Uh, it varied, of course, between different countries, but uh, was uh, overall about 10%. And by um, intergrowth, it was only 4% uh, SGA rate. And the LGA rate was around about 20%. And when you looked at uh, India, it was a high uh, SGA rate by intergrowth, about uh, 17% there. And, but the main thing in, is that you need to look at how these um, cases uh, identify at risk. And the at risk that we looked at was uh, stillbirth rates. So we got classified as SGA by grow or by intergrowth. And they overlapped, of course. And in fact, but 50, 9.6% were small for gestational age by grow only. And these were the cases that, had, that were missed by intergrowth completely, which in itself had no significant association with stillbirth when it was only small by intergrowth, but uh, it was twice as high for those cases um, that were SJ by the customized standard only. So we monitor the head-to-head um, -head comparisons between customers and intergrowth, and you're welcome to uh, um, look at that. Uh, and we have not yet found a study which uh, uh, found in favor of intergrowth, but we're very willing to um, uh, listen and to learn. Um, it has not happened as yet. And I was pleased to see, and Dr. Anu uh, uh, was kindly sent me a couple of papers, uh, um, before this meeting, um, which were uh, really quite excellent uh, local analyses of, uh, of the data. And this was a comparison of regional versus global growth just in the classification of SGA and found that um, maybe I can in, enlarge this a little bit. And that integral 21st chart might have might have very diplomatic, have the risk of overdiagnosing SG and nannies from low and middle income countries, which is absolutely the case and is a worry, it's a real concern. The other paper, which are also very interesting, is that they um, looking at the trends in birth weight uh, with uh, recently and uh, 40 years ago. And that was uh, really uh, quite fascinating. And so this is the sort of new boys and girls uh, chart for uh, the AIMS uh, um, related population. And uh, this in itself highlights another thing that I just briefly want to mention, which is there's three characteristics that we recognize here, working now in an environment which does uh, um, routine uh, uh, scan dating at the beginning of pregnancy, which uh, are easily recognizable. And if I, we were in a workshop or interactive situation, I would ask you to identify them there. And I'm sure you would pick up, first of all, there is this terminal flattening. Secondly, there's this wide distribution at preterm gestations. And then there is this dip, particular dip uh, of the 10th um, and, uh, and fifth or third centile lines there. And this is actually quite recognizable by 
or, um, similar to uh, the Alexander curve, the famous Alexander curve in the United States. You can see this wide distribution here. This is the raw data, wide distribution, terminal flattening um, with pregnancies uh, going on till 44 weeks. And that essentially is uh, an effect of uh, misdated pregnancies, LMP-dated pregnancies, which uh, can have this effect. When we looked at this way back uh, in the 90s, uh, we found that there is this is a distribution of birth uh, uh, at uh, pregnancy, the gestational age at birth uh, in uh, LMP-dated and ultrasound-dated pregnancies. If you put that together, you can see that there is this left shift of ultrasound-dated pregnancies. And that has an effect in terms of when you decide who is or is not posted dates. Um, this has really recently been picked up by an excellent uh, review of the um, um, history of induction by Professor Drive, and essentially uh, he used uh, that curve to sort of illustrate this left shift. What we've also done um, is uh, some time ago again, uh, is to find out what happens when people are using the different protocols in terms of within seven days, within 10 days, whether or not to use LMP if it is within those limits. And every time, so this is LMP only and scan only, every time scan only wins in the sense that at, at least in our environment with scans reasonably quality assured, and we find that um, uh, uh, it is always the best predictor of uh, of the actual uh, length uh, length of uh, uh, length of gestation and uh, day of delivery, and so if you now then look at, but of course you will say that ultrasound scans have got errors, so we accounted for that. So here is uh, here is the gestational age graph and the uh, um, variation of uh, you know confidence interval plus or minus um, uh, seven to eight days in our population, and these are the LM. LMP data pregnancies. And as they go to term and post term, the chance of them being wrong, this is like LMP minus scan, is, is this, this curve here, the difference. And you can see that if you claim that the pregnancy is 44 weeks, the chances are that it is a four weeks out of date. In other words, the date is wrong. So it's most likely to be there. So this is the, this is the error margin the further you go and that's an important uh, element and i think this il is illustrated in this um this uh, paper of uh, looking at the temporal effect uh, of what happened with, uh, over the 40 years um here is the um, old the old chart showed that the modal length of pregnancy was uh, 40 weeks can you see the most cases were there and that's for boys and for girls. Whereas when you then look at the new chart, the modal length of pregnancy was two weeks earlier. And um, in part, I think that would be uh, most likely uh, to be uh, associated with better dating in the, uh, uh, in the recent cohort. So now um, the under, interesting and reassuring finding is that the term optimal weight in Hyderabad seems to apply also to Delhi based on average characteristics of mothers in Fernandez. So the term optimal weight at 40 weeks was 3,223 grams based on the average characteristics of the Hyderabad population that, um, that was served by Fernandez. Now, if you look at uh, the average between boys and girls, um, at 38 weeks, you get 2,894. And if you plot that, that is right there on the 50th centile for 38 weeks. And if you projected that using our proportionality curve, that would then similarly be only 13 grams out uh, at 40 weeks, 3, 2, 3, 6, 3, 2, 2, 3. Now, this is really reassuring from our point of view because we're getting requests for charts from around India and certainly this comparison between Hyderabad and Delhi suggests that the same chart should be used, especially if you're also adjusting for maternal characteristics, which presumably might be very similar or maybe not. 
So then finally, um, I understand that currently um, my obstetric colleagues um, in Delhi and surrounding and probably in many other places uh, still in India using the Hadlock estimated fatal rate child. So this is Hadlock formula up to 38 weeks. And then if you now look at your neonatal chart that I just was referring to, the, the publication, this is where the uh, 50th, 90th, and 10th are. And you can see how uh, it is actually the, the 90th is closer to the 50th of the uh, Hadlock chart and so on. If you want to take that further, to project it to 40 weeks, the Hadlock curve, that's that one. And so uh, the neonatal um, curves there is virtually, the 50th centile is virtually there at the 10th centile of um, the Hadlock chart. So can you imagine how many false positive cases you have as a result with unnecessary scans and concerns and worry and probably intervention as well. And this is what we are trying to avoid by having a chart that actually is a growth curve as well as a birth weight center. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Adosi. It was an excellent presentation. And I think the point very cor uh, correctly made is an importance of customization of growth charts. But problem, as I see in a huge country like India, where ethnicity, even in different parts of country, as it was shown, that the birth weight was different in Fernandes Hospital and in Ames. Even I think in Delhi, if we look at if we look at the private hospitals and a public sector, the average birth may wait. And second important point is patients booking late during pregnancy after 20 weeks or something is quite common in India, where our estimation of a gestational age may not be accurate. So no doubt that we have to sensitize all obstetricians in taking appropriate history for risk factors, measuring symphysiofrontal height, but utility of ultrasound in a mass scale in public hospitals probably can be a difficult exercise. I'm sure there must be many questions, but before we move on to questions, over to Dr. Anu for her comments. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, uh, for this wonderful talk and comparing the individual mean birth weights in North India and then um, uh, in the Fernandez uh, population. So, uh, I mean, uh, we would always uh, be welcome to questions for you uh, because you, your good self are here for, with, uh, with us. But uh, two important things that we would like to understand is, yes, as ma'am suggested and stressed, the, uh, the importance of uh, 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 antenatal ultrasounds in dating, and we can actually see the discrepancy which is happening between plus minus seven, and then it actually escalates uh, uh, exponentially once we cross term gestation, that is one. And second thing is that uh, the availability or, and uh, uh, for, for this ultrasound for the majority of the Indian mothers I mean, they would not be able to get a dating scan. I mean, the, the mothers were actually coming to tertiary care hospital. Well, yes. But then for the other mothers, it, it would be a, a, a difficult task to actually come up to the right center and get the uh, proper growth uh, parameters done for her. Uh, that's all from my side, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gujran, would you like to comment? Can you unmute yourself, ma'am? We can't hear you. Can you unmute Dr. Gujral, please? Request the Dr. Gujral. Now, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. So very nice, uh, Professor Godasi, excellent talk. Uh, we at Gangaram are a mixed sort of population having extremely private patients, economically weaker sections and the middle income group. We have been following headlock and I quite agree with you. You know, we are overestimating the so-called SGR small babies and then we have increased monitoring. But what from a personal observation we've seen that those belonging to the private affluent families have about 200 grams higher uh, term weight than coming from economically weaker sections, you know. And there, if you put back, though we not use those charts, put back to the maternal height and weight, 
it's a small mother, small baby, normal Doppler is doing good. So I think it's time that we also looked at the Fernandez charts, you know, to increase, uh, uh, to, you know, to have lesser number of interventions. We are at liberty to have an economically weaker section where the hospital provides n number of ultrasounds. We have the liberty for the private who can afford. But I think overestimation is also an issue and overdiagnosis, overmanagement is an issue which we got to learn. And I agree with you fully, one size cannot fit all. You have to have a customized size, like we, you, you know, a size for each mother, looking at into her characteristics. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Thank you. Dr. Aparna, are there any questions in chat box we have to take? There'll be many. Uh, Sonia, Dr. Sonia, there are uh, no there are no questions in the chat box. If there are any questions from the audience, sir, uh, can we can get them? Um. My, my question with customization is the degree of mixed ethnicity that we find in the population. So we have at least 22 ethnic groups, which are distinctly different, and we have an overlap between several groups, which is huge. What we've also seen that in the, um, in the middle income population, we have a huge amount of mixed marriages, which are both socioeconomically different, um, and we also have those that are economically equal. But we also see that the ones who are in a very rich group can also have growth restriction for various reasons. So where do we balance this out? So if I may respond to that, um, first of all, um, we have coefficients for mixed uh, uh, mixed mixed marriage uh, pregnancies, um, and we, uh, but of course, that is uh, relevant to the United Kingdom. So, but what we find, which is very interesting, is that um, the birth weight um, expected, the term optimal uh, weight. Expected and in reality, because that's how we um, uh, collect the information from uh, mixed parentage pregnancies, is lies in between the um, the same parentage uh, pregnancies of the respective two ethnic groups. But we have that for the UK, and but for us, this is almost like a dose-response relationship, which further um, validates the concept that ethnic uh, variation is normal and uh, it needs to be adjusted for. Um, what I would, of course, be very pleased to do is to collaborate to derive uh, ethnic specific coefficients for your or all other populations in India. But I do understand it is very heterogeneous, uh, multi-ethnic, huge country. And, uh, and so the, if the data is there, we'd be very happy to work, collaborate and to um, develop uh, ethnic specific coefficients that can then be applied locally. We'd be very pleased to do that. What I showed in my presentation was preliminary evidence based on the publication that I showed from Dr. Anu and colleagues. Uh, is that isn't that much difference, at least as concerns the average term optimum weight in South India, India and in the North of India. But of course, this is really just preliminary. There's much more work that needs to be done. Yes, and if I may be allowed half another question. <clears throat> Within the same ethnicity, we have completely different weight for those on a vegetarian diet and for those on a non-vegetarian diet. Would I be able to adjust this on a customized job? Well, we don't have a vegetarian <laughs> test. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> additional variables to test 
when we look at our multi multiple regression, multivariate, and uh, I would suspect, I don't know whether this is a general generalization that may or may not break, is that there might be differences in the average wheat as well uh, between uh, vegetarians and non-vegetarians or between other characteristics. But if there isn't, then I would love to be able to sort of get my hands off that has got to, <laughs> to test it perhaps for the first time uh, to sort of see whether what the and then to adjust for uh, for 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 normal diet. So obviously there are variations. When I was spending time in India, I also became a vegetarian um, while I was there, and uh, and because it, it, so much good food, who 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 needs anything more? So uh, so uh, I am. Um, I, I, I would be very happy to look at that. And uh, you are correct in identifying that that is uh, an area which uh, does need looking at as well. Thank you. So, uh, sir, there are two small questions on the chat, which is like, so ultimately the basic question is which charts do we use? So there's this small question uh, on the, in the chat. So I think, ma'am, would you like to kind of uh, you know, wind it up by a concluding remark. Uh, well, which chart is probably a million dollar question for which we'll never get answer in India. But I think for all the obstetricians, I would say uh, accurate history taking, during Symphy geofundal heights. And whenever you have a resources, do serial scans, not only see estimated fetal weight, but be in habit of using the which centile this birth weight is falling. I think we'll all obstetrician need to retrain ourselves in reading the ultrasound reports and whatever is best available has to be used in an individual situation. I don't think we can have one formula which applies everywhere as with the customized charts. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. So uh, with that, we end our first session and uh, a big thank to Professor Gardosi for uh, being here today and you know sharing his wisdom with us. And um, so to uh, move to the next session. And before that, we'd like to honor our chairpersons with a small token of our gratitude. Dr. Vatsala, ma'am, could you? On behalf of chairpersons, thank you for inviting us for this. Session. Dr. Gujral, ma'am, we miss you here. Dr. Anu and Dr. Asmita. Yeah, as you can see, it wasn't well to come here, you know, so. Dr. Anu, if you could just. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Now we would like to proceed to our second session, which is a panel discussion on close management of fetal growth restriction. So I would like to invite the panelists for the session, Dr. Sumitra Bachani, ma'am. Ma'am is leading fetal medicine specialist and in Sabdajang Hospital. Dr. Chanchal Singh, ma'am. I think they are there online. Chanchal, Chanchal ma'am is here. Okay. Ma'am is leading consultant at Rainbow Hospital, fetal medicine specialist. Dr. Alok, sir. Sir. Dr. Poonam Tara, ma'am. Ma'am is leading practicing fetal medicine specialist in Delhi. Dr. Reema Bhatt, ma'am. She's not there, she's there. Uh, the expert for the session will be Dr. Deka, ma'am, and Dr. Vatsala, ma'am, who are the leading fetal medicine specialist. Ma'am was a, is a retired consultant from AIMS, and Vatsala, ma'am, is professor at AIMS. I would like to invite moderators for the session. Moderators for the session, Dr. Aparna Sharma and Dr. Anubhuti Rana. Thank you.
So uh, actually, there were a few questions, and I think uh, now they have reflected in the chat box regarding some of the questions from Dr. Nuzat and Dr. Manjupuri. And uh, although they are interesting, but in the interest of time, we'll move on with the panel discussion. Uh, thank you, all the experts and the panelists, for being here. And uh, despite this being a hybrid meeting, we made a special request that all of you have to be here. Uh, because the experience that all of you collectively have is amazing and I'm sure we're going to take back some really, really interesting points and uh, learning points from here. I just want to check if the vision and the, the visual part is okay. Okay, Rinchen? Yeah. So, um, Dr. Reema could not join us today. Uh, we have around one hour for the panel and uh, Professor Gratakos will be joining us after this. So we'll keep to time. And uh, if we are uh, finishing one hour, we'll stop and we won't take the next case. So we start with the case one. She's a 34 year old, uh, sixth gravita. Okay, okay. the panelists cannot see the slide. Can, can, can my screen be projected, please? Okay. Now, she's a 34-year-old lady, sixth gravida, with previous one full-term IUD, two spontaneous abortion, one neonatal, late neonatal death, and she's now at 30 weeks and three days of gestation. Her previous APLA workup work was normal, karyotype was normal. She was started on Ecosprin, and her blood pressure was normal till 30 weeks. But now her blood pressure was 160 by 100, for which she was started on Lebetalol. When her ultrasound was done, it was found to be less than one centile. So this was the finding. And her uh, umbilical artery PI was more than the 95th centile. So Dr. Sumitra, what is the approach to diagnosis and what is the criteria that you would use to define early onset fetal growth restriction? Like, what is the oh, diagnosis? Yeah. Good afternoon approach. and uh, thank you so much for uh, including me in this panel. Uh, can we have the previous slide, ma'am? Yeah, the previous one. So. Uh, well, uh, you've thrown a boogie. I can't wait. <laughs> there is no AC. And there's no Sorry. estimated fetal weight there. So one Sorry. thing is to yeah. start. <laughs> Sorry, I think there was this one height slide happened. Let yeah, me just okay. see if I can find it. But this is actually... No, we can just, this, yeah. Yeah. So one is to establish the, yeah. uh, course the period of gestation by the last menstrual period and the first trimester scan. Yeah. So I suppose the uh, that is there already and that is around 30 weeks. Yeah. Four days and by ultrasound... Uh, I mean, whatever parameters are there, they're less than the third centile. So if you want to uh, diagnose uh, uh, early onset FGR, then we can look at the Delphi consensus and see the uh, solitary and the contributory parameters. So solitary would be the estimated fetal weight less than third, the AC or the AC would be the uterine RTPI more than 90 foot, the PI more than 90 foot. And uh, the contributory, of course, two out of the one of them could be the biometry. So, uh, in this case, I would say this would be an early onset uh, FDR. Right, right. So, uh, this is absolutely correct. And we have actually lived 10 years in this era of uh, you know, stage based and Delphi consensus almost. So, uh, I would just want to know more a little bit about, uh, about the SMF. Uh, SMFM criteria where you know less than the 10 centile is being also being suggested and there has been a re recent articles where you say that what about those situations where the uh, adverse perinatal outcome uh, using these uh, criteria are we really improving the adverse perinatal outcome so that's just of course we have diagnosed as early fetal growth restriction we will monitor using fetal growth restriction but what happens out, out after that so I think this article which you are referring to recently, I had also gone through it. And uh, so the SMFM is basically the, that it is less than the 10 centile and they're looking at the umbilical dopplers. They are not looking at the uterine because they think that the uh, sensitivity for the uterine is very low. It is somewhere around 25, 26% only. So uh, with that, uh, also they find that the perinatal outcomes are equally good uh, compared to the uh, Delphi. So right. the, yeah, so so essentially what what like maybe the Europeans are a little more aggressive and we are 
we are also you know tending to be more and maybe the americans feel that okay maybe so much of doppler is not required but eventually we are diagnosing early onset fetal growth restriction based on the weight with or without the doppler parameters if the weight isolated weight is more uh, less than the third centile then of course we are diagnosing it so ac or estimated fetal centiles or both what is the harm in using both or maybe it is enough one is enough or you should use both so so there have been many many definitions in fact by 2014 there were about 40 definitions of uh, sga and fetal growth restriction so we the delphi consensus was formed just to you know uh, we have a consensus that this these are the definitions to use so if we use only estimated fetal weight then probably we will be missing out on many many uh, fetuses with growth restriction and if we use only abdominal circumference which is a very sensitive marker for growth restriction probably will be over diagnosing many cases of uh, growth restriction so we have to be judicious we have to use probably both of them and uh, if according to the delphi consensus if we have a uh, fetal weight or ac less than 10 centile we classify that as a small for gestational age fetus and if the baby is really small that means the ac is less than the third centile or the birth weight is also less than the third centile then it is obviously a growth restricted fetus yeah thank you but i'm just being let's be honest to ourselves how many times we have felt that the estimated fetal weight is almost normal but the ac is just small and you are just over monitoring and you know just doing so much more so but yes of course whatever we are following is the consensus and even if one of them is abnormal so i think all of us agree here that we are doing the or criteria either ac ma'am what would you would you like to say something on that we are doing ac or estimated fetal weight both are uh, like ac is very sensitive because it is one parameter which will get affected in growth restriction because there is decrease in the liver size i mean soft tissue subcutaneous tissue decreases and the, i don't estimated weight you're taking other parameters also so sometimes you find that estimated weight may be more than 10 centile but the ac is less than 3 so i think we should use either right. and ac is a very sensitive parameter that way the most important thing here is to identify the severely iugr uh, yes. uh, or fetal growth restricted babies and that would include the dopplers or the less than the third centile something right. in between include the dopplers just to reduce the risk of the stillbirth and right. uh, really speaking the early fgrs are the one which is got placenta dysfunction right. so these are the ones which needs to be followed up absolutely and some people also say that because in estimated fetal weight you are measuring four parameters so your margin of error is also more so when you are focusing on ac you are measuring one so maybe you are detecting more you are probably picking up more so chanchal how will you monitor now so here you have a 30 week single term pregnancy with dates confirmed no signs of infection non anomalous fetus and whose estimated fetal weight is less than the third centile with the umbilical artery above the 90th centile so uh, maternal surveillance for preeclampsia because many of these women mm -hmm. even if they are not hypertensive she was hypertensive yes. right to begin with you the frequency of monitoring will vary either biweekly or weekly depending on the maternal parameters and uh, the mother is asked to keep a daily fetal weight count um, monitoring so if the bp is stable a weekly monitoring or to be escalated as indicated so you admit the patient no in our setup we don't right yeah. so consider is something that i would say that of course people who are lucky or lucky should have the luxury maybe would admit for some time and see what happens but yes not necessary and as you said one to two times and monitor by doppler one to two times and growth two weekly so i think that's how we all are agreeing on the monitoring now what happened is like two days later at 30 weeks this was the finding right so 30 weeks and 6 days now and this is what happened to this lady because now she is developing a preeclampsia and you know all of this is prevent uh, can happen now dr poonam what is the diagnosis now and how will you monitor this patient so i think in this case we shouldn't forget the preeclampsia bit as well yes. so the baseline lfts kft all of this is normal mother is stable the problem is the baby okay. yeah. and and it's all together so yes, um yes. obviously the next step is to look for the ductus venosus yeah. and also to have a safety net in the form yes. of a ctg or a computerized ctg depending on where you are so now you in the adf stage 2 situation now and then you want to do look at the safety net right so now she is adf and she is not yet 32 and we are still monitoring and uh, we do have stv so we are monitoring her with stv so here we would like to 
monitor, but uh, role of corticosteroids here, Chanchal? So steroids have, have really run into a lot of trouble, but here I think it is very clear that if iatrogenic preterm delivery is indicated prior to 34 weeks, a single course of steroid should be given. Yes. It should be timed such that delivery happens between two to seven days after your second dose. However, because it becomes difficult. So you may not always be able to time it. In our hospital, the what we practice is, so here the doctors was excellent. And now the app, there is absent in diastolic flow. So every second or third day you are monitoring. So once the DVPS starts rising, that's when we would give this to Yeah, that's a good point here. So again, this is the 2022 guideline which says, 20 to 34 week, 24 to 34 plus 6, while ACOG would say 33 and 6 by 7. So I think these two people will keep fighting. But the thing is, our uh, nursery people also say between 34, up to 34 to 34 plus 6. I mean, that's still a controversy, but this patient would require steroid and we need to time it so that we don't have to repeat it accordingly. Now, timing of delivery in stage 2. So like, how will you decide now? She has absent, she, you are monitoring her. How will you deliver? When do you think you're going to deliver her? Uh, well, I would like to buy time uh, because uh, in your pro, a single day would improve the, you know, perinatal outcomes by almost uh, intact survival by 2%. So yeah. I would continue to monitor and uh, take her till 34 and uh, plan to deliver at 34 unless indicated because of the maternal status, which yeah. uh, of course would be under uh, monitoring uh, would be there and uh, fetal the same as Dr. Chanchal said. Uh, so 34 weeks, yes, and uh, cesarean at 34. Yes, so we will, she's now stage two, so I'll do a cesarean at 34, uh, 34 or 32 to 34 weeks, as we say, we are monitoring her and we, so now she was covered with antenatal steroid, daily monitoring with uh, umbilical artery DV was done and NST daily with STV and Manning. So the, when we were doing STV, this was 5.4, the happy NST, uh, uh, STV was good, but five days later, this happened. So this became, uh, the Doppler was this now, and somehow the STV was this, right? So we repeated that even became worse, right? So now this was the situation on the same day. Okay, so now what is the diagnosis and how will you manage? See, the diagnosis is we're dealing with an early onset fetal growth restriction and the umbilical artery is reversed and the DVPA is above the 95th percentile. Yeah. So in a nursery which can handle babies, I would be happy to deliver this baby. One would want to give antenatal magnesium sulfate. For so do you protection. think that it is crossing the safety net here yeah. or it is not? No, it yes, is. It yes, is. this is what, see, what we worry about is unexpected intrauterine demise. So here the so, DV was still yes. forward. Yeah, but DVPI, I think if you plot it, it will be high. You're already 31 so plus it's not five. Yeah. It is more yeah. than 90. Yeah. 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 And you need time to give magnesium sulfate also. Yes, exactly. So I so think we, I would be happy to give her 24 hours of Maxilf and deliver the next day in the morning when everybody is around. Awesome. Unless there is repeated decelerations on the NSD. Yes, exactly. So this is what actually happened in this patient. So now this is in this particular criteria also by STV, where if you find an STV less than three millisecond here, it is a safety net criteria also where you need to deliver. And this is actually what happened in this patient that she started having decelerations. But again, the role of magnesium sulfate, like you said, that this is a high time that you actually give magnesium sulfate. And there are clear cut uh, guidelines on how to give loading dose of four gram followed by one gram for 24 hours or delivery, whichever is earlier. At least four hours, yes, within birth. So that is how. So Again, uh, Dr. Poonam, what, what would you tell the patient now you're delivering this patient? So uh, just a few words, like how would you counsel this patient and considerations for diagnosis? Uh, for so the uh, counseling would depend uh, on the gestational weight. It will depend also on the uh, gestational age of the uh, baby. And it has to be done in a multidisciplinary setup with the neonatologist actually counseling the patients. Uh, the lesser the weight, the more chances the baby is going to land up in the NICU. Um, and similarly, the same with the gestational age. Right. So again, like we, we always say that, you know, we have to counsel according to our own NICU. So weight related risks, we always say age related risk, we have to give between say now this patient is after 30 weeks almost. So neonatal survival rates are 90%. But again, what is the complication free rate? That is what we need to say that at every gestation, we need to decide what is the complication free survival rate and our unit specific survival is what we share with our neonatologist in together as a team 
we take this table and we counsel that okay this is our survival according to our your weight and your gestation age and this is what we tell them and that's how the survival happens so now this baby was delivered and uh, is still in the nursery and how will you counsel uh, based uh, on the future pregnancies dr sumitra so this this lady is sixth gravid already and this is her first living issue so if she wants to conceive again one thing i just wanted to add uh, was uh, those of us who don't have the cctg i think that is the think question for the experts don't have... yes this okay, is okay. what i have left for okay. the experts okay. right so uh, regarding future pregnancy so one is of course uh, uh, now in the interconception period she has to be monitored till the next uh, 3 months 12 weeks because Uh, for the hypertension because maybe it's yeah, chronic yeah, hypertension yeah. or it was uh, pih so right. that we need to know so we need to counsel her that uh, you and not conceive very soon in future and uh, uh, you need to be monitored for uh, uh, for chronic hypertension or any associated patients or medical treatment as such and uh, for for future then uh, the uh, There is an SGA baby already. The incidence is simple question. 20%. Will you give aspirin? Will you give heparin? Not heparin, but uh, aspirin. aspirin. <laughs> All the uh, she's already made the risk factors. Right. So uh, you give aspirin, but you may not want to give heparin unless there is an apla because she has been ruled out. So you will not want to give apla. so this lady had bradycardia 150 uh, uh, 1050 gram apgar was 6 by 9 and she the baby is currently in the nursery doing well now ma'am uh, dr vatsala ma'am we are in aims but think like we know the situation that we don't have stv so i would like you to talk about it and dr deka ma'am you are you have been here and now you are working outside so how would you manage so both we would like to invite comments from you uh <clears throat> like as uh, she was saying that if you don't have the computerized how would you manage so i think uh, the what the uh, panelists have said that is how you manage you know by physical profile you do the doctor's venosus and you uh, monitor the fetal count and uh, you didn't tell me what was the weight of the mother Oh, she was average ma'am she was not to be okay. very under so for counseling for future you know if yeah. she was uh, overweight she would she should be reducing yeah. her weight and um, so that's how and of course the role of biophysical profile is there and um, fetal well being also should be done along with the color color doctor the biophysical profile and um, 30 weeks you know nst may not be sensitive so you rely more on the dopplers yeah yeah So, yes uh, i think the pigo guidelines in your ones are uh, very clear that there have been few trials where the biophysical profile well, there's not been a head on head trial with the computer ccg but if you do a good biophysical profile the the man yes. new scores uh, it it actually works well or somebody in the places where there is no biophysical profile you continue the normal nst for about yes. an hour yes. and and that would so give some results so visual interpretation of nst has also been it's actually written in the guideline itself that if you don't have ctg you, you the ct stvs you we should rely on the visual interpretation i mean that's what we have we do and we've been doing it for a long time and that's absolutely all right so ability in that trace but you could look for deceleration so the persistent the deceleration is interpretation yeah. of nst and biophysical profile and umbilical artery dopplers but for early onset fgr it's better you refer to a center because the baby will also come out preterm would require nursery care and monitoring so it's better to refer to a place where you have a multidisciplinary approach but you can still use your umbilical artery ctg and biophysical profile to monitor if you don't have computerized right. ctg and uh, Uh, you can't do the venous dv doppler right. you can still monitor yeah. and i think what you also mentioned is that you must have the neonatologist to come sell when it is a time to deliver yeah, yeah because uh, you know the success rate the survival rates and all would be we know that here you can but then it would depend upon what the nursery is like i'm really happy to say that uh, initially i didn't know much about private uh, nurseries and you know in private but i realized that they are also very good but uh, so it's always better to talk to the neonatologists of that place where they're going to deliver yes and let them be there when you're counseling the timing of the delivery yes uh, we talked all about 
of Liker. So has Liker kind of become our That was for Dr. Vatsala, ma'am. Liker. So, ma'am, so like based on Liker as such. Ma'am, yeah, so decrease like uh, uh, decrease like is also uh, uh, that will also reflect a chronic uteroplacental insufficiency. But based on like if you're going whether you're going to make a decision to deliver or not, but the SFMF guidelines do say like if there is oligohadramnos, I mean, depending on other conditions, you may take a call for deliver by between 34 to 37 weeks, but only on Liker, maybe not. Ma'am, so actually, um, Liker has gone only on Liker. Yeah. Yeah. Liker is yeah. a yeah. component. Modified manual. Liker is a, the amniotic fluid, uh, the deepest pocket is a component of the biophysical profile. So you don't take that as a loan. You have to have it yeah. in addition to the bleeding um, and the movements. The point that I was trying to make is that measurement of Liker is a much simpler exercise yes. than doing a good uh, Doppler evaluation, but so uh, uh, more easily available, so possibly uh, should be used more widely rather than recommending the Doppler because Doppler's angle of insulation is wrong so many times and which um, kind of alters the Doppler value. Yeah, but the thing is that uh, we always measure the amniotic fluid when you're doing the growth and definitely that becomes a criteria high risk factor for referral. For monitoring. I know, but it yeah. wasn't mentioned. That's why I just asked. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> so if we were to use the biophysical profile, but for FGR, ma'am, you'll have to have you minimum you have to do a glycal artery doppler for managing FGR mm -hmm. if you want to improve the peritoneal artery. Yeah. yeah. But you're right so, that it's yeah. a much simpler measurement to take. There are two things. One, the cutoff to take an action on a decrease AFI. One has to stick to the definition of a single vertical pool of more than two should reassure. So what happens is we keep getting reference, the AFI is fine. If the rest is everything is okay and there's no history of leaking, I would, the dopplers are much more sensitive as compared to the AFI alone. Yeah. So the cut of the two centimeter single pocket, then I'm okay to go by like that. But it certainly is a high risk factor. Yes. yes. Oligo item. It's just yeah. a cast. Needs yeah. monitoring. Yeah. I have some very good news for people in India for regarding CCTG. So the Society of Field Medicine, along with the manufacturer in, in Bangalore, has developed a CCTG machine, which we have finished the internal validation for. And um, the cost of this unit is 1.5 lakhs only. It's all indigenously developed. We're carrying out the external validations now at three centers. And the, uh, the benefit is, of course, ridiculously zero cost. If you compare this to the cost of a single hospitalization, it's much more than this. A single day in the nursery can cost people that much. And um, the advantage that we will have is uh, in helping facilitating this, of course, is to make it available to the whole nation. There is no waiting list. You place your order, you get it within three weeks. And every member of the Society of Field Medicine will have a five-year warranty on the product, a replacement warranty, which means if it goes out of order, they will give you a new one. And it's so it's really fantastic that um, that we managed to develop this here in, 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 in the country, and it's just available for everybody. If you are still keen to do a CTG, we have a switch at the bottom, which switches you on from CCTG to CTG and you want to make a comparison with something you're more familiar with. But of course, in this day and age, there is no need to be familiar with CTG because we've known it's not reliable. So in that sense, so just, can I add one thing? For yeah, I think computer? there are also some questions yeah. in the chat. So for the computerized CTG, the, yeah. when they had compared the perinatal outcomes, when they used the traditional CTG and the computerized CTG, there was no improvement in the perinatal rate. And if you do look at the secondary analysis of the truffle, there were a lot of crossovers. So many times, even women who were assigned to the CCTG group, they were delivered because of other conditions. Yeah. So I think in our practical experience, we don't have the computerized CTG as yet. However, most women, most of these women will del need delivery because of the severity of the preeclampsia, rather sure. than the Doppler's deteriorating to a point where I have to rush a patient into BOT yeah. for an absence. I fully agree with that. But the point is, 
that we cannot use the CTG and pretend we're, we're, we're following truffle guidelines. Yeah. Because the CTG does not does exist not. in truffle. Yes. Yes. So we cannot pretend that we're leaning on no, sir, something. Sir, that's what my mention. And, and so, we all say it, that, yes, yeah, we can yeah. still do CTG. Yeah. So we that, cannot. Yes. I mean, so tomorrow, that's what Dr. Baker yeah. mentioned, that, yeah. that normal CTG will not be helpful in a 30-weeker unless you have spontaneous decelerations. Yes. So, so we have only doctors. Essentially, even in the truffle Do child. Dr. Poonam. Okay. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, just finish this comment. Yes, ma'am. So yeah, even in the truffle trial, a, a, twin, a fifth of patients were delivered because yes. of the yeah. CTG problems, that less than 2.6 milliseconds. Yeah, yeah. A CCTG. So, CCTG. CCTG. Yeah. 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 Not so that's the reason why it is important. Yeah, yeah. So I think that was the message of the truffle trial that we have to have the CCTG with the DV, everything together, and then because only 10% actually delivered according to protocol. Yes. And that's what they said that you can't rely on one thing Absolutely. just get everything together which is why we have a truffle too yes sir and that's yeah. for late fdr and then they will put C std there also yes yes that's very important. now now let's move to the second case there are a few questions in the chat but there's no time to actually take them up maybe we'll reply them individually in the chat later on. So 28 years old lady, yeah. booked at AIMS, 11 weeks, IVF at AIMS, uh, NTNB scan was normal. However, at, at 18 weeks, there was uh, early onset FGR with placenta, placentomegaly and decreased, uh, liker was decreased. So we have actually spent around 20 minutes on the first case. So <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah. So maybe because we have, uh, so we'll just quickly take this one so that we move on to the late FGR. These are just a continuation of the early FGRs. So the question, so we hear the, the situation is that there is a bulky placenta with like decreased liker and, uh, uh, and a single umbilical artery with no other obvious uh, anomaly at an 18 week scan. So this is an early onset. So Dr. Sumitra, what are the candidates for detailed evaluation uh, in the early uh, FGR? So the uh, in early FGR, uh, there would be mothers, I think the, those who we have screened for the risk factors. So the mothers who've had uh, you know, mothers themselves, uh, there are certain minor and major risk factors. I won't go into the details of those. So right. if we, uh, we have to categorize those and then decide that if the mother is in the high risk category, so, she so needs to be. Suppose this patient, earlier patient had come at 30 weeks. There mm -hmm. we did not talk about the etiology, right? We knew that it was a utroplacental cause. But when a patient comes to us at 18 weeks, then we start thinking that is there a problem? Is mm. there a genetic problem? So, so aneuploidy, yeah. structural anomaly, uh, biomarkers, and uh, uh, as I said, the risk factors, if uh, yeah. uh, other yeah. risk factors which are present, these have to be looked into uh, to uh, infection, uh, early onset FGR. Yeah. Uh, well, so again, like uh, infection is look, something. Look at the other ultrasound findings also, I suppose. Uh, so screening for screen. infection, mm. would anybody would like to do a screening for infection? What is the general recommendation on screening for so infection? If there is early onset FGR, which presents before 24 weeks, I think we should advise a maternal torch IgM and IgG. Compare it with any uh, investigation done in early pregnancy yes. or in the last pregnancy, yes. because it can be quite, in, and offer an amniosynthesis. So if any of the IgGs is positive, one can always look for that viral PCR. Absolutely. Uh, in, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, again, the SMFM series says yeah. that screening for infections only for early IUGR may not be very a viable thing unless you have other markers like ultrasound markers mm -hmm. and all. But yes, if it's a very severe early IUGR, then uh, maybe we should be considering if unexplained who undergo diagnostic testing with amniocentesis, you are suspecting aneuploidies. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, again, interpretation, like you said, becomes a problem unless you have a baseline uh, report, because if the IgG is positive, it's positive for everything, what will you do? You yeah. can't interpret because it is like whether it was early pregnancy or before pregnancy. So it becomes challenging. I think so saving that's the, the first reason. trimester bloods is something I think. Yeah, Dr. we Kurana should be doing. Yeah. As, so I think saving first trimester bloods is something that we have to start as fetal medicine people in India now. As a culture, we should be trying to save the first trimester bloods and see if it is something comes up, we should go back and test them to look for that. But I think you know, because we don't have this system that every patient should have a torch study in the first trimester. So it becomes very difficult when you suspect an infection in the second trimester, you know, something like this that it but makes. But we don't want them to do it, we can just save the blood so that, you know, if something... No, like I'm that, saying yeah. that how to manage yeah, this case. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, if you're doing, uh, see the aneuploidy screen was it just a dual marker no, or no. what? 
it was dual no. yeah so then you see you might be missing an employee also right so if you are planning you talked about doing an amnu synthesis so yes, even if process. you don't have the igg or the igm levels and all if you're doing an amnu synthesis then there is no harm sending it for the infections yes yes yeah so the other thing is that we don't have standardized labs that's a problem we face for torch yes for the torch yes and we get so many different reports uh, for ibdt you just don't have yes even for ict yeah so ma'am we're talking about infection only in the context of an early onset iger where we are advising amnu synthesis because of the microarray and to know which pcr to look for maybe that is the limit yes right so just to like summarize when once we have done when we have ruled out pv uh, a pre eclampsia and anatomic workup and cmv in all cases and especially if they are at risk offer karyotype and array if there are associated malformation now in this particular case we there was severe iugr early onset iugr there was absolutely no growth which was seen in this particular case maternal tort serology as expected cmv uh, this uh, igg was high uh, positive with a high avidity so we never knew what happened it could have been a uh, pre conceptional or a pre this old infection when we did an array we did a cvs for her there was no liker actually so we did a cvs for her so array was normal and placental biopsy actually we sent for toxo pcr which was negative and also we looked for cmv inclusion bodies which was negative cmv was also negative so everything actually came negative we could not detect it patient did not opt to continue i mean she had an iud at 27 weeks eventually this was an ivf conception so she continued the pregnancy as much as possible but there was absolutely no gain in weight aborted at 360 grammer and the placental histopathology was also unremarkable so unexplained severe early onset uh, growth restriction but yeah central dysfunction because there's so many ccl not there yes so but the cause is not known so mostly we don't know what's happening so cannot so we just cannot really counsel on what's going to happen in the next pregnancy but the the point was that when we have an early onset igr it really need to get investigated just one point about the third case is that this was another case of early onset fetal growth restriction which presented at 24 weeks of gestation we followed it up from an absent doppler till the 27 weeks when it became a reverse doppler delivered this patient at 29 weeks this baby is in the nursery but the problem is that this patient was a completely low risk patient so the question is can we predict fetal growth restriction so uh so Alok. yeah so the prediction of fetal growth restriction is really challenging and we have been using various strategies in the past like using color doppler maternal characteristics uh, biochemical markers and other things so but nowadays what we are using is we are using a combination of all these together and run it through an algorithm and then find out the risk of the uh, fetal growth restriction in the early uh, pregnancy only right so we saw what the gap assessment protocol what dr gardosi was also talking about but are we i mean the the in your routine practice when we are actually putting aneuploidy screening the all of the risk scorings are coming so how much are we actually doing it it is recommended that we do a risk stratification we use ultrasound markers we use uh, biochemical markers so ma'am i would like to know from you dr vatsala what do you like you know say about uh, prediction of fetal growth restriction and are you doing it in your routine practice no like we screen historically for the risk factors and accordingly so if the patient is high risk like she has previous history of preeclampsia she has apla then we'll be more careful and maybe we'll do ultrasound serial ultrasound for growth and if she is low risk we will go by clinical examination and if there is a discrepancy on clinical examination then we do ultrasound Right. So that's the algorithm. The sensitivity, yes. uh, the specificity is not very good. It's, it's not only about twenty percent. Yes. So it's yes. how good is it? Yeah. So I think the question here is FGR. Secondary to preeclampsia, yes. I think we are good at predicting yes. that. The rest we are not good at. Yes, predicting. absolutely. And we have no preventive measure also for exactly. That. So risk stratification in the first trimester we are doing based on history, biochemical, ultrasound, but there is no evidence to support routine use of biochemical markers only for fetal growth restriction. But if we are, if such an information is available, we can see what is happening. 
Ultrasound based markers are not currently recommended, but if the patient is at high risk, close surveillance of course needs to be done. And there is insufficient data to recommend aspirin in women who are at high risk. So essentially the purpose of screening is to find a solution and we don't have a solution. So neither do we have a good screening nor do we have a good solution. But this is something I think there are a lot of papers which are coming in talking about algorithms. So somewhere I think maybe another few years we will have something more to talk about this. But right now we don't. So we come to the next case and uh, we have another 15 minutes. So this is a 34 year old lady, third gravida with one living issue. She had moderate anemia, intrahepatic cholestasis, presented with decreased fetal movements. Previous history was a low risk. And when we did the scan, she had her abdominal circumference at the less than the third centile and an estimated fetal weight, which was the, at less than third centile. Rest of the evaluation was normal. So Dr. Sumitra, now, uh, how do you define late FGR and what is your, like, how would you go about it? Yeah. Again, the same, uh, we are following the uh, Delhi consensus. So late FGR would be uh, FGR setting in now detected after 32 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, they would again be solitary and contributory parameters. And uh, solitary would again be AC or the estimated fetal weight less than the third centile. And uh, the contributory would be any two out of three, that is uh, the weight and the AC less than the 10th centile or the crossing centiles, yeah. which is uh, added here, that is a two fall of two quartiles and uh, CPR, the cerebral uh, this thing, redistribution that is being added here, so less than fifth centile and the umbilical PIM more than 95th. So uterine is not there in this. So Yes, so I think this is very important and uh, I would just like to know from the panelists like how how much of an importance do you give to falling of centiles? It's, it's one of the contributing factors. So yes, it is here. It is here. It is the growth velocity. One of, yes. Yes. So one of the commonest mistake people make is how much is a fall? If it goes from 70th to 50th centile, do I call it falling centile? No. It has to be a drop of 50, 50 in yes. percentile. Yes. So that would be. Yes. yes. So two quartiles is like earlier it was maybe 75th and, and now it, now it has become 25th, 25th yeah. although it is more than the 10th centile, yes. it is still, yes. it is a yeah. fall and yes. then that's how yes. it becomes important. Now we know the difference between early onset and late onset and it's important here also to say that uh, if at any point in time there is an absent and diastolic flow, we need to know that it is a late fetal growth restriction, uh, sorry, early fetal mm -hmm. growth restriction. It's not a late fetal growth restriction because the umbilical artery is not really affected in the late fetal yeah. growth restriction. And that's why the detection is a problem. Diagnosis is a problem uh, in the late fetal growth restriction. And why it is becoming more and more important is because it's a cause of preventable stillbirth. And I think the whole of other country is going to focus on this and it's up to us fetal medicine specialists to make this thing an easy diagnosis and management. So now the PI was again raised, umbilical artery PI in this condition was raised. So uh, Chanchal, what, what are, how are you going to manage it next? So here we have a singleton pregnancy, non-hypertensive mother, yes. 34 weeks with umbilical artery above the 95th. Yes. So the, this again, the frequency of surveillance will be weekly or bi-weekly depending on how the mother's perception of the movements are, whether she develops hypertension or not. And it would be, the aim is to prolong it till as close to 36 weeks to 37 weeks as possible. Anytime it becomes absent, you deliver. Anytime. So I'll just stop yeah. you right there because there are already, sir, as expected, a lot of questions on CPR yes. and delivery. Yes. So, <laughs> right. So yeah. I want Can you I to be like very, I very just... categorical yes. about yes. it. When do you yeah. want to? Yeah. How so will you when monitor we first with is the, what is the role of CPR? So the CPR is a simple ratio, but if you the, the new ESO guidelines have made a clear distinction when the CPR is low, A, when the umbilical artery is above the 95th centile, it can be low then, or if your MC is below the 5th centile. So when the CPR is low because the umbilical artery is above the 95th centile, those we are okay to deliver between 36 to 37 weeks depending on other parameters. I'm talking only about the doctors. If the CPR is low only because of the MCA and the interval growth is satisfactory, the manings is okay, the movements are good, the mother is not hypertensive, there's no maternal indication for delivery. They've written deliver, consider offer delivery between 37 to 38 plus six with weekly monitor. Yes. Yeah. So it's there is a very good. Yeah. Yes, yes, late FGR, BFGR guidelines, yes. 
So I think this is what we are talking about. I'm talking about CPR in PT growth restriction data. I'm in not the, talking about ADA babies. Yes. So we are talking about CPR in fetal growth restriction in late fetal growth restriction. And what we are trying to say here is that in late fetal growth restriction, if the umbilical artery is normal, it is not raised, then we do not deliver the baby between 36 to 37 weeks, even if the CPR is it's abnormal. Deranged. Absolutely. And if the CPR is abnormal only because and the umbilical artery is also abnormal, then we deliver at 37 weeks. So I think this is something that we would like to say. The questions are already there in the chat and I think we have addressed that. So again, so this is what we are talking about, which we just discussed that the timing of delivery would be with a good monitoring at 37 plus weeks between 37 to 38 weeks. And this is what, again, we are saying that if the uterine artery PI is more than the 95th centile or uh, uh, estimated to be less than third centile, we deliver by 37 weeks. But if it is only a CPR without an umbilical artery derangement, we can take the pregnancy. So for forward. umbilical, if you see above the 95th, 36 to 37 plus six. Yes. With weekly month. So this is the category that we are talking about here, that if the umbilical is no abnormal, then we deliver earlier. But if the umbilical is normal and it's only CPR. So please understand that CPR abnormality, we are not delivering before 37 weeks. We have referrals and I think ma'am will agree that even 34 weeks we have seen people referring for delivery because CPR is abnormal. Uh, yes. And low MCPI has no role in doing hydrogenic preterm delivery. Yes ma'am. So ma'am please can you just uh, no role of CPR in early like what Dr. Vatsala is also saying that in early onset or early delivery we do not advise the role of a role of CPR is not advised. So this baby was monitored and uh, delivered at 37 weeks and the baby was fine. So uh, ma'am coming to this thing is the problem with FGR is under diagnosis and over treatment. So we need to find a ba fine balance because under diagnosis leads to still births and over treatment leads to increased inductions and cesarean sections. So just a few comments on it before we just move to the last case. So I think, <clears throat> I think see everything has to be balanced as we said for a neonatal death versus an intrauterine death. I mean, sorry. Uh, yes. Cesarean and, section. Hmm, cesarean section. So, I, uh, uh, so the monitoring is the most important part and the timing of the delivery is very, very important. The place of delivery where, it's, uh, where the baby uh, is going to be looked after in a good nursery, those things are very important and should be planned out. Not only with the tertiary care doctors, obstetricians, but also with the neonatologist for a best outcome. So I think in our setup and in every setup, we feel that uh, neonatologists make it very sacrosanct that we cannot deliver a baby even one day before 37 weeks, unless it's absolutely, absolutely important and required. They will ask, why are you delivering? And I think that's what makes it uh, very difficult and take that decision. So Mitra, you want to ask? What is your opinion on UCR? That's investigational. Do a thesis. Okay. I think that's what yeah. happens. Yeah. I thought it was already being done. One of the no thesis, yes, okay. but not routine. Not, uh, yeah. So this is the last case. So uh, 28 year old, primary gravida, 12 weeks, uh, twin pregnancy, just adding to the confusion. Now, this lady, she in the first trimester itself, there was a discordance. Now, please, this is DADC. We are not doing DMC, thankfully. Now, this is DADC and this has a CRL discordance of 12% in the first trimester. So, uh, Dr. Sumitra, I, I think it's starting with Sumitra a lot. If you want to pass the question, you can pass. Dr. Alok, please answer this question. So, uh, uh, discordancy in twins is if the difference between the two, uh, the fetal weights is more than 25%. So, the implications are that that one baby may be having some abnormality or uh, in case of monochorionic, this is not monochorionic, yeah, no, no, but, uh, but in those cases, we may be dealing with an early TTTS. Yes. yes. So uh, essentially, a lot of people have looked even in the dichorionicity also, they have seen that, you know, composite neonatal outcome, even in the first trimester does affect even with a dichorionic twin. So this baby started having uh, discordance. So there are a lot of adverse effects which have been counted. 
So we know that, okay, this pregnancy was at high risk right from 12 weeks. Now we followed it up at 15 weeks, the discordance increased to 16.4%. And then at 18 weeks, it became 32%. So now Chanchal, I just want you to talk here about the twin charts. Are you interested in twin yes. charts? Yes. No, they, I think they will eventually find their way to a routine yes. practice because when we are labeling fetuses at growth restricted, if you use singleton charts, there was the there's a paper in yes. uh, White Journal in 2021 from the St. George's group yes. they, where they have looked at uh, uh, about 1,000 odd twin pairs when they were using the singleton charts to classify twins as growth restricted, their, uh, the incidence was 30%. Yes. And there was not much difference in the neonatal adverse outcome. Yeah. So the whole story of growth restriction is to identify those fetuses who are at risk of adverse neonatal outcome. Yeah. When they use the twin charts, which are available free of cost on the twin trust uh, website, the incidence dropped down to 6% and was significantly correlated with the adverse perinatal outcomes in terms of development of hypertensive disorders in the mother, as well as hydrogenic preterm delivery at less than 34 weeks. Right. So I think twin charts will eventually be useful in decreasing the cohort which we are, which we are managing as high and risk. treating. There yes, absolutely. Study as well, yeah. Which uh, suggests that uh, this, the twin pregnancies manage, uh, you know, they can manage the singleton, but beyond 30 weeks, there is a drop in the uh, centile of the baby's And that's yeah. the reason why the St. George's group in particular suggests that to use that stock. Uh, uh, um, you know the charts. The charts, absolutely. So I think that they will find a way, as you're saying, and because we are the in, in fact 50% more de de uh, detection of twins we are doing by using a singleton chart. So, uh, Dr. Alok, how would you define FGR in twins? So uh, FGR in twins, the def uh, the definition is little different. That we do not typically use abdominal circumference for uh, DCDA twins. Yeah. Okay, and the rest of it is almost the similar, that if, if it is less than the third centile, then it's a FGR fetus, or if the uterine artery or umbilical artery PI is more than 95th centile, then also if the estimated fetal weight is less than the 10th centile, then also it's in growth restricted fetus. So uh, just taking this on now, at 18 weeks, this was there is no right answer or a wrong answer, but would you offer selective reduction to this baby? Selective fetal reduction. As of now, no. Okay. As of now, because no. yes. See, I think the question would be, would you offer an amniosynthesis? The question of yes. selective reduction comes yes. afterwards. So I would offer an amnio, amnio twin amnio in right. fetal growth restriction, which presents before 24 weeks. If there's an abnormality, it will give you a reason to do it. Because we've seen sometimes the fetuses, they improve. Right. So by the way, she did not. Right, so she we did scan at 22 weeks, 24 weeks, and the discordance actually kept on increasing. And uh, again, 26 weeks, and she had uh, absent to reverse flow at 27 weeks. Now, we were in a situation because the baby was 643 grams, one of the baby was 643 grams, and then we she received counseling at every visit for testing, for, for because she was referred by somebody for reduction, So, but we were not willing, and she was not very keen also and we were not very sure about what to do so she and at 27 weeks she was 643 grammar and an redf in one of the babies so what would be the management plan and delivery considerations so in twin pregnancy the um the median delivery time is actually much more as compared to the singleton yeah. so we have some room so even if we can get this baby to around 32 weeks uh the, the normally the other baby which is growing well will be benefited. So a good counseling session needs to happen with the couple to understand, to make them understand the risks, the stillbirth risk with respect to the DV uh, changes or the umbilical artery changes, which is very clear from the singleton data. And then to uh, you know make them realize that we've got to take it for 32 weeks and we'll be monitoring continuously. So the surveillance has to be there, the neonatologist has to play a role and she should be delivered at a tertiary center where both twins can be looked after. Right, absolutely. So like, it's not like a monochorionic twin where one single death would result in the uh, demise of the other twin. Although the reported there co-twin is, demise is 3%, 3%. in a dichorionic twin. So there is a risk if the single fetal death happens. But what is the other option? Even if you go ahead and do something, even at, at a 14 or 16 weeks, 2 to 5% risk of uh, intervention is anyway there. So this is something that uh, you know we really need to counsel on intervention versus follow-up and then plan accordingly. 
because uh, counseling for iatrogenic prematurity if suppose this baby we uh, asked and based on antenatal testing then what about the cotwin who's normal so this is something that we need to counsel and think about so this baby the, this was the normal twin who who was growing well and uh, following the growth chart and uh, this was the other one who was falling off the centiles and uh, this was the discrepancy was 58 so just to finish this case ma'am just your last comments on when would you deliver this baby so this baby is still continuing okay uh, so basically right, right now right now you have to consider that the risk of uh, single fetal death <clears throat> of the iuja twin would be quite negligible so monitor so monitor and let it carry on as much as as long as you can but however if the time that the baby is in severe the risk you have to assess what is the period of gestation what is going to be the effect of delivery to the normal twin yes so this would need a, a you know basically counseling at that moment that if you for example if you it has to be done at 28 weeks yeah for example, then the prognosis for the normal twin, you are reducing it because yeah. now both of them will be small. Right. So you need to counsel the parents and find out what they want. Yeah. You know, they may not want two babies in the nursery. Yes. Yeah. They would rather say that let this IUD occur yeah. and let the normal one progress to term. Yeah. Absolutely. So counseling would be very, very important also along with the neonatal as I say. And then decision, of course, you also have to take give them the inputs yes yes i would say that if it is below 28 weeks or so let the iud happen yeah. and let the other one uh, normal one continue so, ma'am we continue till uh, 28 we counsel them now 31 plus 3 she's in the ward she's in the she's asking <laughs> are you going to deliver me at 32 or 34 so it, it's it's i think in aims it's quite okay <laughs> it will depend upon whether they want to you know you have to uh, talk to them and find out what they want actually it's a cost also. but if you want to deliver you can yes so uh, this basically it's all about counseling and the shared decision making so yeah it was a controversial case so i think that's that's all we have for the cases so i would like anubhuti to summarize do we have a minute ma'am i have a, a question about the uh, fetal reduction selective fetal reduction in dcda there are a lot of our postgraduates who are logged in so uh, fetal reduction in dcda would be that if at all that fetus would be affecting the pregnancy outcome maybe there is a gca i mean what is the uh, the clarity on that like would, would, which fetuses would be reduced Can in I case of a dcda so that would be yeah, yeah, Dr. Sanjali, you would yeah. like. So, uh, fetal reduction in a dichorionic you're asking about fetal reduction. See, fetal reduction in a dichorionic twin, I mean, when we talk about reduction, we are talking in terms of either a selective reduction, where you have identified a structural or a chromosomal abnormality in one fetus, or you're talking, uh, or the second scenario is many parents opt to have a single baby because either they have a previous baby or it's just their choice. So, most of the times we would have crossed that bridge by 12 weeks. The, the the risk of miscarriage related to the mm. procedure is not because of the needle entry it's because of the dead tissue that we leave behind mm. that can that is why the risk of uh, miscarriage do, by doing a reduction would be after 16 which is around 20 percent uh, yeah. yeah after 16 no, the preterm labor also increases in this case no? so the risk of abortion so, is what you labor. want to ask is that because it's a dadc twin can we just leave it leave it so if there is some malformation which is causing polyhydramnios which is going to affect the affect other the baby then you reduce then it would. if it's an open neural tube defect causing uh, an nkf flea causing polyhydramnios will cause the preterm delivery then you will uh, reduce it or or if it's something like you know uh, a baby who's going to live with significant neurodevelopmental abnormality which the parents do not want right so i for think example this case could have been a candidate for a selective reduction that is the yeah that's so we had all of this discussion ma'am to be very honest we had discussed all of this with the parents they did not want an amniocentesis also so i mean so that's if you don't uh, if they don't want an amniocentesis nipt yes. now has a place in twins Yes, in so fact, so that video would have been a first line for the, you know, yes, so the, for the screening for yeah, dance. We do offer an IPT routinely for twins, ma'am. Yes, that's, yeah. that's a very nice. So, please, some.
So just to summarize, correct dating is important to diagnose SG and FGR. It is important to differentiate the SG and FGR because they have different perinatal outcomes. Dopplers are very important in diagnosis, monitoring and timing of delivery, and it should be an integrated mm. fetal monitoring to optimize the outcome. We have done that if umbilical artery PI is more than 95th or estimated fetal weight is less than third centile, the timing of delivery is 37 weeks. However, if there are normal Dopplers and estimated fetal weight between third to 10th centile, we can take up to 38 to 39 weeks. MC and CPR is not an indication for iatrogenic preterm delivery. Late onset M uh, FGRs, if they have abnormal MCAs and CPR deliveries between 38 to 39, maternal condition should also be kept in mind during timing of delivery and antenatal corticosteroids are very important for pulmonary maturity. Thank you. For less than 32 weeks. So, so you, sir has a comment here. Yeah. Yes. What I was thinking of is that we constantly have diagnosing on the basis of the Delphi consensus. Yes, sir. We have the option of diagnosing. Now, if you have evidence from a randomized control trial and you have a Delphi consensus, which is the stronger evidence? RCT. And therefore, why are we using Delphi? Because there is no RCT. And where, where did the Barcelona stuff come from? Anything from the experts on this? That was... Sir, I think we can, uh, if Professor Gratikos has yes. joined, we can ask I this. I think we, we must keep an open mind on this. Yes. And we will ask him this question. Yeah. And then decide today, each one of us, on whether we are going to use a Delphi consensus or whether we're going to use the staging that he is proposing because it is stronger evidence. Yeah. I'm of the personal opinion that the data from Barcelona is based on very, uh, the, the, the decisions from Barcelona are really based on very, very robust data and not just expert opinions. Yes, every so, Delphi consensus. Uh, now I think sir will present the data on their outcomes also, but uh, the 10 year data from them, they show that they have uh, better detection rates for SGA. Yes. And um, so, I mean, they have been working on their protocols and uh, you know, they're following their protocols and they've been collecting data. Plus so the only data. difference I think they have, they have is that they don't take the AC. Which is nice. Mostly, yeah. Yeah, because here yeah. we have the whole afternoon so, we've been discussing yes. over diagnosis, over diagnosis, and over diagnosis. Yeah. So why are we looking for excuses? So I hope we answer that in the next. Yes, half yes. Hour. I think yeah. we'll ask uh, a lot of questions yes. on that. Yeah, yeah. He, thank they you. They have a different take on CPR as well. Yeah. yeah, which is what I'm truly looking forward to listening. Yeah, to. And I'm yeah. so glad we're using that as a end lecture rather yes. than the starting. Part. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, I would like to thank the experts, Dr. Deka ma'am, Dr. Vatsla ma'am, and all our panelists for this discussion. And uh, I would request Saloni, can we just, uh, to, I would like to, ma'am, Dr. Vatsla ma'am, can you give, ma'am, ma'am, and please come here. And Dr. Kurana sir, can you come here? I request you to give all the experts and the panelists the mementos. Wonderful. Do the honor. Come forward, please. Oh, okay, it's green and green. Thank you very much. And then I'm going to keep yours while I'm
Can I invite chairpersons for the next pa uh, panel, please, for the next session? Sir, Ashok, sir, Seema, ma'am, and JB Sharma, sir, please. So um, we are really honored that we have with us today, Dr. Kurana, sir. Uh, we've already introduced him. Hi, sir. sir, can you join us on the dais to chair the next session? Sure. We know, sir, as the professor and uh, uh, em uh, mentor emeritus of the Society of Fetal Medicine, we also have with us Dr. Seema Thakur, ma'am. Uh, she is a geneticist and also the um, uh, chairperson of the Genetics and Fetal Medicine Committee of uh, AOGD and we also have with us, we are very pleased to have with us Professor J.B. Sharma, sir, who is professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences with special interest in urogynecology, but sir also does the maximum number of high-risk pregnancies and obstetrics. So sir, we are really pleased to have you here with us and I request the chairpersons to please take the session forward. Thank you, we are honored. Thank you for inviting me and really, uh, test congratulations for this exciting uh, uh, FGR session, I think, which is, was very timely. And we are so pleased to see uh, Professor Deepika Deka, our teacher, who started fetal medicine in, in AIMS. And uh, do we have to introduce the speakers like that? Hmm? Well, I, I don't think um, Edward Vatikos needs introduction. Um, we sort of uh, echo his um, algorithms if I can call them that straight away, and I think every postgraduate has learned them by heart because we know when we go into practice and we work in isolation, we really don't have a choice. It's very uh, robust recommendations, and we know how to handle things. Uh, he is uh, uh, from, uh, from Barcelona, and many years ago, after his basic training, he moved on to realize uh, that the fetus was uh, really the, the object of interest for the rest of his life. He has emerged not only as the most brilliant clinician ever, but a brilliant researcher and the finest teacher. We are all familiar in India with the uh, fabulous uh, uh, teaching and learning opportunities that we have in Barcelona. And we, a few of us are lucky enough to get selected every year to go there. And he's always very kind to India. And I thank him again for being with us this afternoon. And I will take his word as the final word on how we will approach the growth restricted patients uh, from this evening onwards. So over to uh, Professor Edward Gratikos. Can we unmute, sir, please? Hello. I don't know whether you, you can hear me. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Very well. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kurana, for this very nice uh, introduction. It is a great honor for me to be again in touch. I would like to be that it was face to face but it's virtual, which is okay as well, in contact with my very uh, well-respected colleagues from, from your great country, from India. So it's, it's really a great pleasure. I am knowing every year more and more Indian colleagues. I, I don't know where I will finish. I think I will finish never because your country is so big that it, I, will, I will extend. I, I would need a few, a, a few lifetimes for that. But, but really, it's, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be with you. So I, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start my presentation. And uh, I ask you please to, to let me know whether you can see my presentation correctly. Yes, yes, we need you to go full screen. Yes, yes, that's what I'm trying to do now. And I hope my computer is not failing me. Yes, I should work now. Um, this is perfect, yes. Okay, I hope you can see my, my, my mouse moving around because I will point at some things during the- Moving perfectly and we hear you perfectly well. Okay, thank you very much. And let's, let's go for it. So I will try to summarize in this presentation the concepts uh, that guide us for the management of fetal growth restriction. I will try to do that in 25, 30 minutes. Hope I do not extend beyond time. 
on uh, for many years we have uh, summarized the management of growth restriction in three very important steps uh, which are of course uh, the, the first the identification of the small fetus which is clear at the first um, door to entering into a problem uh, the second very important step that we need to do is to distinguish whether this is high risk or low risk small small baby and finally the most important question for clinicians how should i follow up this pregnancy and what should be the timing of delivery we that do that uh, in a sequential manner and i will extend very little on the identification because i will focus more on the second and third and third um, stages today uh, just i think we all agree the best way of doing the detection of the small fetus is to do an universal ultrasound it has to be uh, at 36 weeks and the best way we have found is to do a single ultrasound of 36 weeks and there is good evidence for that there are randomized studies showing that and of course you could use as well growth velocity but um, we have shown we and others have shown that it works as well or a little bit worse than taking a single uh, ultrasound you look at this study cross-sectional works better so when you do one ultrasound it works better and there are different reasons for that that if you want we can discuss later uh, although intuition would say it's much better to follow growth velocity in reality for the diagnosis does seem not to provide a lot of advantages and rather it could work a little bit worse so um, we still recommend just a single ultrasound as late as you can if you want to pick up the late onset small uh, fetuses um, and of course we are always concerned what happens with these very early severe cases that okay they are not the majority but they are the most severe ones and certainly you will miss them with an ultrasound of 37 weeks and you need to follow other strategies you need to combine you can select those cases who had high risk for preeclampsia if you are doing screening the first trimester you can look at the biometries 20 weeks if they are very small or you can use our calculator to see the conditional growth between the bipareatal diameter between 12 weeks and 20 weeks was okay if it was too low there is high suspicion that this baby could go into growth restriction or a small or fetal smallness and of course it's very high highly recommendable to use a high risk score um, we use an adapted and adapted in our center an adapted score from the Royal College. There are some other scores that you could take a look at the Royal College one is quite good. So if all these, if any of these uh, gives you a high risk, then the recommendation is then you take farther uh, ultrasound scans 28, 32, 37. Uh, if you do screening tests in your population and you look at this, at this high risk uh, criterion, uh, you will find that you are doing these ultrasounds in the range of 5 to 15 percent of your population, depending on how, how high risk. So this is a way to approach the detection of the late onset and the detection of the early onset. And of course, we could spend one hour talking about detection, what is better, velocities and, and different moments of doing the ultrasound. Um, should we use abdominal circumference? Should not, but uh, as I said, uh, let's try to focus today more on once we have identified the small fetus, if you follow just uh, what I said, universal ultrasound at 36 weeks, you will pick at most late onset cases and by identifying high-risk pregnancies at 20 weeks, you will pick at most early onset cases. Once you have picked up this small baby, you now you need to know whether this is a high risk or a low risk. And this is very relevant. It is true that it is very relevant, especially for the late onset cases, okay? Um, you have excluded that there are malformations, there are extrinsic causes, and now I need to know whether this is a baby that has a placental insufficiency or whether this is a small baby that I don't know what it has, but certainly as long as it remains as low risk, small as GA is going to have normal perinatal outcome. So that's the first way to start doing uh, identification of risk and not under treating and over treating, which is always our concern. We need to identify this because the management is going to be completely different. And as I have mentioned, this problem is particularly relevant in late onset cases. Not that much in very early onset because early onset cases, the majority of them, if they are isolated, are going to be of placental origin. 
how should we do that? For many years, we used the umbilical artery Doppler. And it is true, it works very well in distinguishing high risk versus low risk. But the problem is that it only works in early onset cases. Why? Because in the majority of late onset cases, it is normal. So we have a problem here. We need other markers. It's not that the umbilical artery is not good. It is good, but it's going to be normal in virtually all late onset cases. That's why we need to use more sensitive markers. And the best one we have is the cerebral placenta ratio, which combines the umbilical artery with the middle cerebral artery. This is an example. This is a case in which you have done an umbilical artery PI and you find that the percentile is 80, so you're going to classify it as normal because it is below the 95 centile. And you have done an MCA and the percentile was 20 and you're going to classify it as normal because it was above the P50, the P5. But when you do the CPR, the CPR tells you, okay, but both of them are deviated. So this is not normal and the CPR is below the fifth centile. The CPR is abnormal when the umbilical artery was normal. And that happens very much in late onset cases. So while you are doing the CPR, you are measuring both vessels and you are combining them. It's not that you are forgetting about the umbilical artery. You are always measuring the umbilical artery, but you have to remember that you can have a CPR that is abnormal with a normal umbilical artery as you have just seen, but when the umbilical artery is abnormal, when it is above the P95, the CPR is going to be abnormal always, virtually always. So by doing the CPR, you are already doing the umbilical artery. And that's very important to remember when you use the criteria that we propose. The CPR is very important. And we know also that the uterine artery is important. There are many studies demonstrating that when you have an abnormal uterine artery, there is a high risk for adverse outcome. And also, once you have identified that the baby is abnormal, the centile is important. If the baby is below the third centile, so it's, it is not only small, it is very small. This is a predictive factor. And all these three factors, CPR, the uterine artery, and the uh, centile, a very small centile, they are independent. And I'm going to insist on that. So you have to measure the three, because even if two are normal, if only one of them is abnormal or positive, you know that this baby is going to have a much higher proportion of adverse outcomes, as you can see in this study. And there are many others in a similar way, showing that when all factors are normal, this small baby, well, these three parameters are normal. This small baby is going to have a very similar pr a probability of complications. Adverse outcome as compared to normally grown babies, even if the baby is small. So this is a low risk SGA. But if one of the three or two of the three are abnormal, the risk is going to be substantially increased. So this is the way of identifying whether this small baby is a true fetal growth restriction with a true risk of adverse outcome, or it is a low risk small for gestational age. And this is summarized in um, the way that we classified. And why are these markers working? Because the pathophysiology of growth restriction that has been very well demonstrated in many studies in the literature shows that when the baby starts suffering placental disease, it has an increment in the uterine impedance, the uterine artery Doppler, and also there is a centralization. It starts sending more blood to the brain, also to the heart. We can look at the brain by the middle cerebral artery and the CPR. And by using these markers that we have mentioned, the CPR, the uterine artery, we can know that there are markers of placental disease. We know that this baby is not only small, it is a small and it has a placental, probably a placental insufficiency. So, by combining the small baby with these three parameters that I have mentioned, you can classify high versus low risk. And this is the most important step in identifying whether you have to do something else with this baby or you have, or you could just set, follow it in a more relaxed fashion, all right? The important thing is that you need very few parameters for that. You need the estimated fetal weight and you need to do the Doppler 
factors, of course, you need to do the umbilical artery, the middle cerebral artery for estimating the CPR, and then you measure the uterine artery, which is important because you are going to pick a small proportion of cases where everything is normal except in the uterine artery. So our recommendation is measure the, or take a look at these three parameters or indices. And the good thing of this way of classifying fetal growth restriction is that it works well whether you are dealing with a late or an early onset fetal growth or a small baby. If you are dealing with an early small baby, you can use the same parameters. You can use umbilical artery only if you want, but if you look at three, you are not going to make mistakes. Okay? And I understand that there are some guidelines, um, there are some consensus experts that include different, but if you take a look at the literature, the summary of everything is here. Now, and, and, and I, I would say that this is standard today, okay? But now you have invited me, you are more, many of you are experts, so I'm going to introduce a little bit of innovation here, okay? This is the way what we are using today. But over recent years, we have been hearing, um, we have been receiving different inputs. And two of these inputs are the angiogenic factors, and the other one is the growth velocity, okay? And let's take into account these two factors. What happens with angiogenic factors? Angiogenic factors, you know, they are very good for preeclampsia, but we know they are good in general for identifying placental insufficiency. We produced this study already almost 10 years ago. There have been many other studies showing that when you have a small fetus, if you measure the angiogenic factors and they are abnormal, this baby is going to have poorer prognosis. So in this study, for instance, we compared and we asked the question, what is better to do Doppler or to do angiogenic factors? And we found they, that they work the same. They are as good. So it's the same if you measure the Dopplers or if you measure a placental growth, rate, a placental growth factor and soluble flips. So the conclusion of this and many other studies that have come later is that angiogenic factors and Doppler predict the same. The thing is that they don't add to each other. So if you measure one, you could as well skip the other ones <laughs> because they work as well, but they are not complementary. And the same happens, and now I change the subject to the growth velocity. I have told you just five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, that growth velocity was not extremely good for diagnosing, for diagnosing. But once you know that this baby is small, is it a good prognostic factor? And some studies say, yes, it is. And the Sovio study in the, in the Lancet showed that it was indeed the growth velocity. <clears throat> we have performed some studies as well, and we have found that it works. Again, the growth velocity and Doppler predict the same. So if you have Doppler, you can as well skip and not use growth velocity. If you don't have Doppler, you could use growth velocity. What is, how can we integrate that in what I just mentioned about classifying a fetal growth restriction? So far we have always used fetal growth restriction is a small baby that has any of these three uh, parameters. Now we could say, okay, but we're going to include two further ones. So we are going to change our, our proposal very soon. And we're going to say, yes, this definition is okay. <clears throat> but if you measure placental growth factor and it is very low, or if you measure growth velocity and they are abnormal, you could as well consider them as predictive factors that allow you to call this small baby fetal or true fetal growth restriction or high risk fetal growth restriction. Okay. So we are going to update this in our calculator very soon and it will be available very soon. So this is not changing the way you are classifying them, but it is including further parameters. Okay. What I'm saying here is exactly the same. I have a small baby. How could I know whether this is low risk SGA or whether it is a true high risk fetal growth restriction? Well, I have one criteria, which is this baby is very small. It is below the third centile. For sure, I know this is going to be fit growth restriction. And then I use a second criterion, which is whether I have abnormal Doppler in the CPR or the uterine artery or low 
placental growth factor or abnormal growth velocity. So it's a, a little bit or a further complication or a further alternatives to classify. That's something we need to do in view of the um, impressive amount of evidence that has appeared over the last years. Uh, in the beginning, we had one or two studies. Now we have like 15 or 20 studies saying the same. So I think it is impossible not to include placental growth factor in the definition of fetal growth restriction. So that's something that might change. It's not going to change in the next year, but it's going to change uh, over the, la the next five, six years. And I think in some uh, scenarios or in some settings where uh, access to doper might be difficult, measuring placental growth factor could be a great add to identifying these high-risk babies. Okay? Because identifying high-risk babies is essential to prevent uh, mortality, particularly in fetuses in late, at, uh, in late pregnancy, as I will discuss now. So after very briefly discussing how can we identify the small feeders and discussing a little bit more in detail, how can we distinguish whether this small feeders is a high risk fetal growth restriction or a low risk SGA. Now it's time to see, how, okay, how am, how am I going to follow this baby? And this is really a critical aspect because when you have a protocol, your results improve. This has been very well demonstrated in randomized trials, truffle, other uh, randomized trials uh, in late, in early onset, like the truffle, late onset, they found much lower rates of stillbirth than they were expecting. Why is that so? Because they were using a protocol. Everybody was following these babies in the same manner. So it is very important. It's not so important, the details of the protocol. Of course, it has to have some sense, but you can change a little bit. The most important thing is to avoid clinical variation in our practice. So you need to offer always the same when you are faced with the same circumstances. And you need to look in an orderly fashion to this and, and answer the same questions. And these questions are easy. Why, some of you know our protocol. We have identified the small fetus, as, as we have just said. We, we distinguish between high and low risk and that's it. You try to classify this baby. If it's a low risk SGA, you can wait until 39 weeks and you can follow it every two weeks. If it's fetal growth restriction, there is high risk. You should consider delivering a term or earlier if there are signs of progression of deterioration. And we will discuss more in detail, of course. This is the first exposition. But I want to highlight that this is <clears throat> the most simple way of expressing the protocol. And this contains everything that I'm going to say and everything you can find in the literature. So this is the summary of 30 years of research from different groups, including ours, of course, but many, many others. And the first consideration is why a single protocol if everybody is talking about two clinical scenarios? We all agree that there are early and late onset IUGR or fetal growth restriction, we know that there are some cases where uh, the small fetus is detected early. We very easily find abnormal umbilical artery, abnormalities in the Doppler. We know that these babies have a very high risk of dying in utero. And our main problem is the timing of delivery of these babies. How are we going to follow up and, how are we, and when are we going to deliver? So the first question when you identify as a small baby at 28 weeks, 29 weeks is, should we deliver? Yes or no. And the second question, okay, if we don't deliver, when should we call back this patient? Should we admit her? Should we call her tomorrow? Should we call her in one week? What would be the wise thing to do according to evidence? And then we have another scenario, which is the late um, mild small baby, which normally is detected much later in pregnancy and before 37 weeks is going to have a very small risk of death. It's going to have a risk of intrauterine fetal death at term because that's when contractions start and these babies normally have no baseline problems. They have problems when there are contractions. Okay, So they are, they are better off, of course, than our early onset fetuses. So the main problem in these cases is detection, not the timing of delivery is the detection, is the identification of the high risk. So indeed, we have two scenarios, but the answers, the, sorry, the questions that we ask are always the same. 
The first question, is this a small baby? The second question, is this a high risk or low risk? Is the same. And the third problem is the same. Should I deliver, yes or no? And when you look at the protocol, then the protocol, you see that most cases, most small fetal cells, when you classify them as fetal growth restriction, they are in stage one, when they are late onset cases. Most of them, it can, it, nothing is universal, okay? But the majority of them. And many cases, when they are diagnosed earlier, some of them will start at stage one, but many of them will progress at least to stage two, and um, sometimes even further. So yes, there are two different scenarios, but with a single approach, you solve the questions of these two very apparently um, diverse clinical situations. So is the detection is the same, the classification is the same problem, and then you define the stage of severity. And then by using this approach that, I, as you will see, I am repeating once and again, then you solve the problems. It is true that in late onset growth restriction, the majority of times the classification is enough because you are in stage one and that's it. You just need to decide to deliver a term. And then when you have an early severe fetal growth restriction is when you are going to use the full classification with all the stages. But by following these questions, you solve the problem of all small fetuses. And that's the point. And now let's, let's try to go a little bit deeper in the, in the practicalities, okay? Late on the fetal growth restriction, let's try to divide, divide, because that is true in clinical practice, I'm going to find myself in two different moments. As we said, this is the majority of cases are going to be here. I am doing an ultrasound, sometimes at 34, sometimes at 36, and I'm finding this is a small baby. So my first question is, this is a high risk small baby, should I really do something or not? And then I have the criteria that I have discussed before, and if I classify as field growth restriction, the recommendation is to plan delivery at 37 weeks. And if it's low risk SGA, to wait until 39, okay? These are not clear cut um, moments. Of course, it's not as uh, we said always that at 12 o'clock uh, at the night that the woman is going to 37 weeks, you have to put the, the sirens blaring and then put this woman into induction urgently. Of course not. It is at any time between 37, uh, uh, zero days and 37, six. Normally we do it like that. And then for SCA, not waiting more than 39, no, certainly not more than 40 weeks. So approximately, okay? The main message is that if you have a high risk baby, don't wait longer because there is good evidence that mortality increases. And you have very nice studies that, as I said, have 30 minutes uh, and you know very well, and you have been discussing for hours, I guess now, you can discuss for days of growth restriction, but you have the very nice studies of Lindquist, the very nice studies of Gardosi, where they show very clearly that after 37 weeks, if the baby has fetal growth restriction, mortality increases. And this is undebated. It increases very little, we agree. But if you do it over hundreds or of, of over thousands of pregnancies, you are going to see fetal deaths and you are going to see major morbidity. So that's why the recommendation and our protocol, and that's what we do here, is to deliver uh, once 37 weeks are reached. And we wait more if we classify as low risk. So in summary, you use the protocol, you classify high risk, low risk, and you have the protocol, but oh, yeah, you are dealing with a late onset case. So in most cases, you will stop here. You will stop in the first line. Most late onset cases, indeed, if it's fetal growth restriction, it, it will be in stage one because there will be a uterine artery that is abnormal. There will be a CPR that is abnormal. It might be a, a small baby. So it, very rarely you find stage two in late onset uh, fetal growth restriction. Okay? And so the majority of cases, they remain like that. They are, and they remain. Even if you diagnose it at 33 weeks, the majority of cases are going to remain in the same stage. And I will show you some data now. Um, so that's the first um, clinical scenario. But as you see, it's the same protocol. Now, there is a question here that I have been asked for many years. Um, it was, how do you know that this is safe? Okay. How do you know that when I find a small baby and the doppers are normal, that I can wait two weeks? 
for looking at this web how do i know that this is not going to change all right and uh we needed to wait until we had more data that's what we have done all these years um this is a study that we published <clears throat> already two years ago in the white journal where we report the results of 10 years following small babies with this protocol and these were 1300 cases 1300 if you take a look at this first slide, we have compared the outcomes of all the births that took place in the maternity where we did the study that were grown normally. Okay? And then we took a look at the outcomes of those small babies that we classified as low risk and the outcomes of those, those babies that we classified as high risk. You can see clearly the difference. Small fetuses that were classified as low risk had the same risk of adverse outcome as normally grown fetuses. Of course, there's a small difference, but it was not significant. So essentially, you should uh, uh, retain the idea that our more or less was 3% risk. But you see, it was double risk in those babies classified as fetal growth restriction. So even if we knew that these babies were high risk, even if we took care of delivering them, of looking at them very carefully, even so we had uh, a double risk of adverse outcome, neonatal death, metabolic acidosis, intubation or ICU admission. So certainly the classification works and works in both directions. It identifies high risk cases, but also it identifies low risk cases. So when you see a woman and you measure the CPR and the CPR is normal and the uterine artery is normal, and this baby is above the third centile, you can say the risk for this baby to have an adverse outcome is the same that the normally grown fetus. And that's a very important information for management. And you don't need to look at anything else because all the literature is condensed in these three markers. In a few months or years, we will be also measuring placental growth factor. And you could say this baby has a normal placental growth factor, so it's low risk. Okay, perfect. But when once you have classified low risk, you can be reassured that the risk remains the same as a normally grown fetus. Let's take a look at the same from a different perspective. Okay, The classification really works when we use uh, everything was more normal in these fetuses that we classified as fetal growth restriction in this study. And the very important thing is that the three parameters that I have mentioned before that we use for the diagnosis, all three were independent predictors. You see, none of them crossed the line of non-significance when put in a combined analysis. So they are all independent. So it's as important to measure the cerebral placental ratio as measuring the uterine artery Doppler. At the moment of diagnosis, of course, this is not the uterine artery Doppler at the first trimester or at the second trimester. This is the uterine artery Doppler at the moment of diagnosing the small baby. Okay? All three are independent. So measure the three of them because with that you will pick all cases. <clears throat> and the other very important question I was uh, alluding to, how safe it is to monitor these babies every two weeks. Now, let's take a look. Among these 1,300 cases, we more or less, we classify half of them as SGA and half of them as field growth restriction. And when they were SGA, we followed them every two weeks, as our protocol says. And when it was field growth restriction, we followed them every week. We had four stillbirths in the total study, and all of them were in the field growth restriction group. There were no stillbirths in the SGA. In 600 cases, there were no stillbirths. So now, after some years of explaining this protocol, when some, someone asks me, how do you know that this is safe? I can tell you because I have followed 600 cases and none of them died. That's why I think it is fairly safe to follow them every two weeks, okay? Okay, but what is the risk that you are going to reclassify? We said that this is SGA, and some of them are picked up at 34 or 35 weeks. How do you know that it, they are not going to change? Yes, some of them are going to change. 9% of them changed, but 91% remained SGA, okay? 
But the good thing is that by following the protocol, we had zero stillbirth. And that's, I think, a very important thing. Okay? And only four in the field growth restriction cases. So the protocol works and prevents a lot of deaths. Look at the historical series. Look at how these babies die. They die much more, I can tell you. When you have a protocol, you can prevent stillbirths. And that's a very important message. And now let's close the chapter of the late onset and let's move to the early onset over the last five minutes of my presentation. As we said, a completely different scenario. My main concern is when uh, should I deliver this baby and how should I follow up this baby? And for that, we cannot use these diagnostic chronic markers anymore that we were talking before about what well, we need to use short-term prognosis markers. And when it, uh, so short-term says which markers are telling me whether this baby can die or what is the latency time. So how much time I have ahead of me before this baby is going to deteriorate. And these questions are best answered by combining umbilical artery Doppler and ductus venous Doppler. You can as well incorporate computerized CTG, you have it. You can use biophysical profile if you want. Of course, you have to use conventional uh, CTG, but all these three, the red ones here, are going to tell you information at the end of the deterioration, but not at the beginning. And that's why Doppler is so valuable because you need to know this information because what you need to know is whether this baby is going to die over the next days. That's your main question because that's what's going to guide your decisions because you are going to balance this risk against the risks of delivering this baby, right? The only thing I can do with this baby is to deliver. How risky it's to deliver. So your balance is always the same. How sick is the fetus? How much time do I have? Is this baby really going to die over the next days? And how risky is to deliver? When the risk of deliver are low because I am 34, 35 weeks, of course, I'm going to be very liberal in my decisions. But when the risks are high, and very high, I'm going really to wait for this baby to be close to death in utero. Otherwise, I will not kill it by taking it out. So that's this balance. And so you need this information. The risk of prematurity, you have them. You have them by definition because you know them beforehand. The risk of this specific baby that you have before your eyes, you need to use a classification based on stages. You need very few measures for that. It's even simpler than before. You just have to measure the medical artery and the ductus and the CTG. And you have to use CTG, of course. And, and if you don't have ductus, even with umbilical artery and CTG, you could do it quite well. And this is so because we have an impressive amount of evidence that shows the natural history of uh, fetal growth restriction in early on cases. So once we have a placental disease, the umbilical artery becomes abnormal. And now we are talking about the early onset case. We know that on average, we have 28 days, one month before this baby will finally deteriorate or die. If we wait, there will be a moment where the umbilical artery will become absent diastolic in its flow. And at that, from that time onwards, on average, we have three weeks of latency time. If we wait more, because we cannot deliver at some point, there will be reverse end diastolic flow in the umbilical artery or the ductus venosus will become abnormal because the pulse sensitivity index will be above the 95 centile. And here we are already in a situation where we think that my, we might start having acidosis. This is already a very severe moment. Uh, we might have not more than 10 days now. And at some point, probably the babies under acidosis and the ductus venosus is going to be negative or reverse in the atrial flow. The atrial flow of the ductus venosus is going to be negative or reverse, uh, sorry, absent or reverse. If you are using computerized CTG, the variability, short-term variability is going to be below three. And at that moment, you know that you have between four and seven days. If we would wait, because we are observing this baby, we can't do nothing because it's very preterm, whatever. If we would wait and look for the natural history, we would realize that at some moment, the biophysical profile becomes abnormal. And then hours before the baby dies, we could start observing decelerations, spontaneous, not with contraction, spontaneous decelerations. And that's a natural history. And we can use that to our advantage. 
we can classify these moments in uh, stages because the Doppler changes progressively. The problem with CTG, VPP, and CTG are that there are yes, no measures. Yeah, they are valuable, they are useful, but they are only useful if you measure them every day. The Doppler tells you what is going to happen. The CTG is telling you what is happening now, yes or no, okay? So by combining everything, you can classify stages. You can classify these different moments of progression into stages, and then you know uh, that it's going to be reasonable to follow a baby that is in stage one every seven days because if the rest is normal this baby should progress normally once you have absent end diastolic velocity you have to shorten your intervals and once you have an abnormal ductus or reverse then they daily follow up because this baby really could die and this is the limit that you should wait 37 weeks when it's stage one 34 weeks 30 weeks so as long as you are in stage three and you are not 30 weeks you are going to wait because you know that as long as the ductus venosus is not absent or reverse, this baby is not going to die. Once you reach 30 weeks, you deliver. Okay? And this is the reasoning that most guidelines and protocols use. Some in a more synthetic and easy to understand fashion, some, some in a very complicated, very complicated as we experts like to do because we like to make life very complicated because otherwise we wouldn't be experts um some explain it very complicated but if you look carefully most protocols say the same because they cannot say otherwise because that's the summary of the literature as i said of the last 30 years okay? and i said i insist the measures are very simple obliquilatory ductus venosus ctg you only need that you can do vpp if you want we don't use it in our protocol because it's very time consuming and there are a lot of evidences showing that it's very difficult to interpret. And uh, in our center, we have computerized CTG, but if you don't have it, that's fine. You could even make it uh, more simple. But the only thing you need to remember is that in order to be used in a proper fashion, these fetuses, when they reach stage three, they need daily follow-up. If not, some false negatives can occur. Of course, if you measure a ductus venosus on a Thursday, and you wait until the next Tuesday to do the ductus venosus. Of course, ductus venosus is not going to work that well because you need to look at it every day. And we know, and I know very well, that in many centers in the world, it is a challenge to do a high level Doppler every day. And that's why if you have computerized CTG, it could be okay. But if not, this protocol is going to predict well what it is going to happen. Of course, you have to do CTG every day. Of course, you need to combine the three measures that I have mentioned. Some centers say, okay, we cannot do ductus venosus or we cannot do ductus venosus every day, or we cannot do ductus venosus at all because we don't have the expertise, whatever. You can use the protocol without the ductus venosus, okay? You can use only umbilical artery doppler, and then you are going to classify states for only by the presence of um, decelerations, and in this case, then probably it's more it's, it's better to use uh, the biophysical profile. But if you have the ductus venosus, as I have said, probably it's not necessary. Okay? So you can use the protocol with the ductus or without the ductus, and you can use um, the calculator, as I will show now very, very briefly uh, in both ways. Okay, again, very simple measures, and everything uh, is um, wrote down to these conclusions that are always the same. First, identify the small feeders, distinguish between small, low risk and high risk, and then classify whether it's SGA, fetal growth restriction, and this will tell you exactly what you have to do. And this is summarized in our calculator, which is uh, very simple. I, and I always say the same, it's very simple, but it summarizes a lot of, a lot of, of evidence. We're going to produce a refurbished version of the next months, as I, as I have mentioned. Essentially, it's not going to change very much. We're going to add the computerized CTG here as an option. We're going to put the doctors as an option. So if you don't have the doctors, you could say not available. Okay, so we're going to improve it a lot. But we have not changed it very much in 10 years because it still works very well. And as, I, as you have just said, uh, we uh, have been following babies for 10 years with this protocol and the results have been excellent. Um, so this is more or less the same. Um, you can find these calculators very easily um, by like, like Google, just look at fetal medicine Barcelona calculators and you will find them there. 
And what these uh, calculators are telling you is exactly the same, always the same. Is this baby small? Is it a high risk baby? Number two, third, how should I follow it? And what would be my timing of the leap? And with that, I solve the problem, late onset, early onset. And uh, this uh, medicine is like life. There is nothing black and white, it's full of grace. So of course, there will be situations where a calculator, a protocol will not solve your problems. But I can tell you, a protocol can solve your problems in 95% of cases. That's what we're looking at when we're doing medicine, to make always the same decisions when we're facing the same circumstances. And this is best done by a protocol, and in this case, it's summarized uh, by these calculators. So I'm going to finish here um, by thanking you again very much. It is really an honor as I am not uh, tired of repeating it. And it's a real, real pleasure to be uh, in contact with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gretikos, for being with us again. And I noticed that there is so much that has happened in the last three months that we have moved on. And this is why we keep inviting and troubling you all over again. Uh, one of the reasons why we they had this as a, as a hybrid meeting is so that we could take it across to an even larger audience. And we have succeeded in doing that. We have over 700 people logged in uh, for your talk, which was 100 more than for the previous part of the program. We have a few questions in the box, and if permission to my co-chairs, if I may ask these. Um, and um, some of these are questions that have arisen in the earlier part of the afternoon here. And the first of these is this, that uh, in terms of evidence, when we talk about our staging, has that been based on a trial or data, or is it a Delphi consensus like we have uh, the one we've seen in the white journal sometimes and a lot of people like to use? Yeah, when we talk about, sorry, I, there was a, 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 a word that I missed. When, when we talk about what? Uh, you see, uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when we look at your staging and the- uh, The staging, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, no, the staging, well, if, if the staging is based, of course, it's not based on a randomized trial. The staging is the summary of the literature. And if you look at different guidelines, some of them call them stages and some of them call them different degrees of severity. So the name is irrelevant. We decided uh, almost 20 years ago now to call them stages. And the, uh, the whole thing started because in our center, it, that, that was a mess. Yes. The residents uh, had a mess in their brains about managing, and the staff had a mess in their brains about managing these cases. They were making all the time different decisions. So we decided to create a staging system. And that was a, something we decided internally, okay? We said, okay, let's call it stage one, let's call it stage two, stage three, and then we're going to make the decisions based on that, because otherwise the decisions were made based on how stressed I am today, how was my last case, uh, how the face of the father, how aggressive the father looks of, of this lady, or how which neonatologist do I have on call today that is going to be angry at me if I take this baby out? So uh, this was the reality in our center, and, and this is the reality in most in most hospitals in the world. So we said, okay, let's let's summarize. But if you look at our stage one, is what the majority of classifications they will say, okay, the progress, the first progression of IUGR, and then some other classification says, okay, there is a high risk of hypoxia when you have absent and diastolic velocity. But in general, the majority agree that there is a situation when you have abnormal umbilical artery but positive diastolic flow. There is a further degree of severity when you have absent and diastolic velocity. There is a further degree of severity when you have reverse and diastolic velocity. And then when you have absent or reverse atrial flow in the ductus, this is really serious. And this is the literature. There are studies containing thousands and thousands of cases con um, confirming that this is the natural history of these babies. And we have good evidence from randomized trials that when you follow a protocol based on these premises, that you can call them stages, you can call them whatever, then the mortality decreases amazingly. In the truffle study, we had only 3% mortality. They had, I, I was not participating in the study. So um, this, is, this is, so the, the staging is simply another way of calling it that to my understanding and in my experience, it simplifies things and it makes it easier. And, and that, that's the only reason we use the stages. Yeah. And the second question that arose uh, when we started this discussion was do we move on to standard charts or do we still try and run after customization? That's a very, 
that, that deals with the first part of my presentation, which I didn't want to extend too much into because it really, I think it's, it's amazing how much time we spend discussing these things. Um, uh, in, in, in our center, we use um, charts that were produced uh, here locally in Spain, uh, but we have tested these charts in Latin America and many other places in the world, they work, they work relatively well. Um, in general, we don't use customized charts because uh, that complicates our life a little bit. So um, what I always say about that, if you have local charts, using local charts is the best thing. If you have charts from India, that would be great. Okay. Um, if not, you can you can take a look at some charts. For instance, the um, intergrowth charts are okay, but in some countries they don't work that well. So that depends. If in your country they work well, you could use them. Um, and then, of course, you can use customized charts. But if your population is fairly homogeneous, probably you are not going to see many differences. So it is okay to use customized charts. But the truth is that we in general don't use them very much. Uh, but I think. Customized charts are, 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 are an option, but you could use the who charts, but definitely the best option uh, to my understanding. And I, I always reject to participate in, in round tables uh, discussing about uh, sentence because it bores me very much. And um, uh, I think it's not so important really. <laughs> Thank you. And um, the other question that is recurring on the chat is one that um, we have some data from the Embrace survey of 2020 that suggests that people of African origin and people who originate from South Asia have a much higher incidence of stillbirth and uh, growth restriction. And so do you think in a country like India, where we have an incidence of almost like one in four, we should actually do a routine scan at 30 weeks as the NHS is now recommending? Um, yeah, that's that's a very good question, and, and I think that um, that deals again deals with identification. Of course, uh, if you have such high um, proportion, uh, but I wonder whether your high proportion is across all um, socioeconomic levels um, in the society. I wonder whether in uh, what we would call mid to high socioeconomic or educational levels, you have a twenty five percent growth restriction or small babies. I wonder, is that is that so? No, we have it across all groups. Across all groups. All groups. Uh, I mean, of course, we, we normally recommend in uh, an European country, we recommend uh, um, a, an ultrasound at 36, 37 weeks, because the proportion of small babies is going to be 8 to 9%. And uh, there is a small proportion between 1% and 2% that are going to be uh, starting earlier, which are the early onset severe cases. And these ones are best picked up by 20 weeks screening, as I said. Uh, yeah, if you have 25% in your population, and this happens across all different uh, strata of the society, so it even happens in people who are uh, well-fed and have a good socioeconomic uh, status and education, um, there are two questions. Are they really uh, growth-restricted babies? If you have higher rates of stillbirth, that might be the case, of course. And then, yes, certainly, uh, then you should adapt your protocols to your reality. And, and maybe, maybe it could be wise to recommend uh, an additional ultrasound at 30 weeks. Um, I think it would, be, it would be very interesting to know what is the best way of picking up this, this 25%, you know? So it would be very good to say, okay, good uh, a contingent screening and uh, is recommended by keepers and providers to say, okay, let's look, and we all do more or less the same. So you have 20 weeks, you say, okay, let's take a look at how this baby has grown between 12 and 20 weeks. Let's take a look at if there are risk factors according to NICE or according to the Royal College. Let's take a look at the first screening of preeclampsia, which were the results. And if any of these is suspicious, then let's let's follow this, this lady at 28, not at 30, I would follow her at 28. And if the risk is very, very high, maybe at 24, um, and then the rest of the population. That would be a very interesting study to do in your population. Uh, and the other thing is just to go straight and do ultrasound for everybody at 30 weeks. That could be fine as well. But certainly 25% is a lot, yes, as compared with other regions in the world. Yeah, you see, we also are the stillbirth capital of the world. We have the largest number of stillbirths in India, not just because we have the largest population in the world as of now, but also because we actually have a much higher incidence of stillbirths. 
And so yeah. we need to look at this very carefully. We have more questions from our chairpersons and in the chat. So I'll hand over to the to my co-chairs for this. Yeah, no, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I think you made everything very crystal clear, especially this, uh, uh, I mean, our debate of small for gestational age and fetal growth restriction and how to differentiate between the two. Because quite often it has happened, like in our hospital also others, that by mistake we made the diagnosis of FGR when they were SGA and, uh, you know, customized charts were like, you know, they were not suitable for our uh, population. And uh, so that uh, you have made very, uh, very clear. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I think most questions have been covered by you and uh, in the chat. And maybe my co-chair, you want to discuss some last I just wanted to ask with this same uh, calculator for twin as well, twin pregnancies, like, you know, uh, the same calculator for the FGR, you know, stage one, stage two, the same calculator you use for the twin pregnancy, or there is a separate? Yeah, for twins, you mean, eh? for twins. Um, yeah, sorry, because sometimes the sound arrives a little bit distorted. Uh, yeah, well, if in our calculator we have customized charts for calculating uh, the size of twins, um, let's let's be clear. Uh, when we talk about twins, of course, we all understand that it is very important to clarify whether we're talking about dichorionics or monochorionics. Okay, if we're talking about dichorionics, uh, its fetus has its own placenta and its fetus is on its own. Okay, so we normally follow them with the same protocol. Yes. That is true. But if you look at the evidence, you will find very nice studies showing that the latency times in twins are longer than in singletons. We don't know why. So in, in a singleton pregnancy, when you have absent in diastolic velocity, you have three weeks latency time. So there are 21 days before this baby will die or deteriorate severely. If this baby is a twin, this latency time increases to, let's say, 50 days. And there are, as I said, there are nice, very nice natural history studies showing that. Why is that so? We don't know. So you can follow it with the same protocol, but first you need to be aware that the latency times are going to be different. And the second thing is that the decisions might be a little bit jeopardized by the other twin. So what should I do if the protocol is telling me deliver and I am now 29 weeks or I am 30 weeks and the protocol tells me deliver because you have reverse and diastolic velocity in the umbilical artery of this small baby, but the other baby is perfectly fine. So I'm going to try to save one baby. I'm going to convert the other baby into a sick person because this baby is well now, and I'm going to convert it into a sick person because I'm going to convert it into a premature baby. Uh, it's a difficult decision. And sometimes it might be, you can really, that, that's where the protocols of course do not cover everything. And sometimes we wait until 31, 32 weeks, we discuss with parents and we say, okay, we should take this baby out. But considering that this is a twin and there is absent and diastolic velocity, we are 30 weeks, but we think that it's going to, let's say, resist a little bit longer in utero and the other baby is perfectly fine. So let's try to find a balance between both babies. And I think these are situations where the role of the MM, M, MFM units uh, makes sense. Of course, you need to discuss. And, and, and so the protocol is very informative. It tells you about the risk and you make the informed decision. But of course, my decisions are not only affecting one patient, are affecting both. And so let's try to find a compromise. That's what we do normally. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Maybe Dr. Abarnan, sorry, you want to okay. Yes, if we can give her a mic so that, yeah. There you are. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Graticus, for such an excellent lecture. Very clear and lucid. I just wanted to ask you your data, the newer data that has been presented uh, about the FTR and the SGA and the fact that with the SGA, there was no stillbirths, but with the weekly monitoring, of the FTR uh, uh, number of patients, about 600 or so, you had four stillbirths. Would you be able to tell us the reasons why the stillbirth happened when they were monitored so aggressively? Uh, well, they, they were monitored every week um, and there were four cases in 700 patients. So this is, uh, as you can see, this is less than 1%. There were cases that came to the visit and the baby was dead. And, uh, with four cases, we cannot really figure out. Uh, maybe the mother, when they had contractions when at night, um, we don't know. 
I think, uh, but really, I can tell you, it's very low rate. If you look at the studies, uh, you will find uh, death rates of five or 10% in these cases, sometimes even higher. Uh, so four in 700, I think is, is a great number. But what it tells you is that, of course, in medicine, you can never do the perfect thing. Uh, as you know, you can have patients admitted into the hospital and sometimes they die before your eyes. Um, you have them admitted and during the night the baby dies. I mean, we did all as good as we could, but we cannot always prevent adverse outcomes. I think our aim is to keep these adverse outcomes as close to zero as possible. And I think in a high risk population, having four uh, deaths, you have to take into account that these pregnancies were diagnosed at an average gestational age of 34 weeks right 34 35 weeks um so some of these cases were 32 weeks 33 weeks on um yeah uh, in some cases there was a fetal death but uh, in general what it says is that if you're going to follow every week uh, these fetal growth restricted babies you are going to have a risk of interuterine fetal death of less than one percent and i think that's a positive name <laughs> And there, well, we've covered up all of them as a summary, not the individual questions. And there was just one question that came in right at the end. And they said that, yeah, and the question is, uh, so it is that we will do a scan definitely at 36 weeks for everybody, that's for sure. Uh, what is the opinion on that? 36 weeks for everyone um, is, is something we should aim for. Um. I mean, if you look at the European guidelines, you will see that in many countries, this is not universally recommended. And they are still basing this uh, consensus in very old studies that showed that there was no uh, influence in doing an ultrasound in the risk of prenatal mortality. But these studies come from the 80s. They are very old. And the ultrasound was done at 32, 33 weeks. If you look at more recent studies, there is a clear difference. And I think that one thing that the POP study showed in, in, in the UK is that by doing universal screening, you pick up 60 to 70% of all small babies. Okay, you will never pick them all, okay? Because ultrasound is not perfect, right? But you pick 60, 70%. Why? If you are doing contingent screening, so I am trying to select those women in which I will do uh, an ultrasound, then I find 20%, okay, three times less. So um, I think these data are very supportive. Uh, there is another recent study from the Netherlands where they claim that doing universal ultrasound did not improve outcomes, okay? But when you look at the rates of ultrasound in the group of universal screening, it was 100% as expected. But in the group of contingent screening, it was 90% <laughs> because in the end, everybody had an ultrasound done for one or another reason. So it's impossible to, to draw meaningful conclusions. I think we have to take a look at the studies, as I mentioned first, of Lindquist um, that are very nicely showing that when you detect, when you detect the, the um, when you detect the small baby, um, then you are going to find, um, um, you are going to decrease uh, the mortality clearly. And if you allow me to show, to share my slide, to share my screen for just, uh, a few seconds so to straight you what can I'm saying. Share right away. Let me share my screen. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yes, we see it. Yes. And full screen, please. Yes. Perfect. We see this and we see the arrow. Okay, so you see, these are, this is a study on 25,000 cases, 25,000 pregnancies. And this is the rate, the rate of a serious fetal complication according to the weight of the baby. Look at the white dots first. And as you can see, no, look at the, sorry, <laughs> at the black dots, okay? So if you have normal weight, if you have 20 centile, 10 centile, you see there is a slight increase in serious complications, but this skyrockets when you go below the 10th centile, okay? Now look at the, at the white dots. You see that, okay, you still have a little bit higher, but completely different. And what is the difference between the black and the white ones? These were not detected, these were detected, okay? So when you detect SDA, you reduce radically mortality, radically. 
And this has been shown as well in very nice studies conducted by Cardozzi. Very similar results. So you can reduce remarkably the um, risk of death at term by detecting small for gestational age babies. So I really don't know what further evidence do we need to, to be willing to detect these babies. And there is also very good evidence that if you want to do it, the best way of doing it is a universal ultrasound as close to term as possible. Because yes. as we have shown in some studies, and we did one here in Barcelona, when we did the ultrasound at 32 weeks, we detected 30%. When we did it at 36 weeks, we detected 65%. So that's why you need to go as late as possible. And then the early ones, you will pick them up at 20 weeks. But the late ones, just pick them as close as possible to 37 weeks. And um, be reassured that the complications start once you reach term, not before. Yes. And we have one quick question. There is this doubt on should we use the abdominal circumference as a diagnostic criterion as suggested in the uh, consensus or yeah. should we stick to using your guidelines which we seem to have been very successful with for the last so many years um i i think this is uh, this is a relatively open question of course well well as you know consensus documents are nice but uh, in a way you have to keep 30 people happy and in the end they are like political consensus where no decisions are taken because everybody needs to be kept happy i mean <clears throat> it is okay but sometimes you are surprised with some of the recommendations but okay let's go exactly to the ac if you are in a very early pregnancy and you don't have uh, normative ranges of estimated fetal weight because you are 19 weeks, 20 weeks, okay, I think it is fine. You can use AC. You can use AC. But using abdominal circumference um, alone when you can use estimated fetal weight probably is useless. I think it is okay, but in general, if you want to do it, I think it could be okay for a screening. But if you want to read very sure, I think you would be much better off if you use estimated fetal weight. But I would not take a very strong opinion on that. I think it, it is okay to use AC, but I think it will you will miss part of the information. And probably you could classify some fetal cells that are not true growth restricted babies. But yeah. Wonderful. Yes, thank you. So if I, if I were to give some nice carry home messages on the controversies, we have understood that we are moving definitely towards standard growth charts, um, even if it sounds politically incorrect. The second is that there is a 36 week scan that needs to be put into place. And the third one is that the AC is something that may just end up in making us overdiagnose some of our conditions when we are using a very nice, robust estimated fetal weight. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been marvelous to, to be updated. It's been marvelous to go back to basics and, and for learning all this in such a short period of time. You're always one of our most popular speakers and thank you for always being there for us. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks to you very much. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Professor Dranakos, for being there today. It's always a pleasure to listen to you, and I think it's never enough, actually. We want to keep listening to you, and it's always wonderful listening to you. So uh, thank you for, being, for taking the time out and being here today. So uh, with this, we'd like to close the session, and I would really thank the chairpersons for moderating the session so excellently. And uh, with that, we come to the end of the CME today, and I take the honor of uh, you know, proposing the vote of thanks. So... Uh, but before that, I would like to invite uh, Professor Vatsala Redwal to give the mementos to our chairpersons, please. Uh, Professor Gratakos, I think he has uh, logged out, but we would like to also, uh, we would have wanted to give him a memento from our side. So thank you, Professor. And you yes. can carry one with you when you go there next. Yes. <laughs> yes. I would do that. Yes. <laughs> Anubhuti, you can join him. Sadhya, 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 you can join
He doesn't know about the whole garden already. So, so this, this is your we shall do it together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Propose the vote of thanks. So before we join for tea, it is my proud privilege to propose the vote of thanks. I would first begin by thanking Professor Nija Bhatla, ma'am, uh, Professor and Head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, for encouraging all our academic endeavors. Uh, of course, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kurana, sir, for guiding us in all these activities. Dr. Bimal Sani, sir, President of SFM, for being with us always. Uh, AOGD has been supporting us Dr. Uh, uh, in this endeavor, Dr. Asmita Rathor, ma'am, Dr. Seema Thakur from AOGD, uh, Dr. Kamal Gujral, ma'am, and Sumitra, Secretary of SFM from AIMS, Dr. Vatsala Radwal, ma'am, and uh, of course, we've had today Dr. Deka, who's just left, but it had been pleasure to see her today. The organizing team. Dr. Anubhuti has been a part, very active part where she's helped uh, Dr. Rinchan, Dr. Sonia, Dr. Saloni, of course, our fellows, Dr. Sadia and Dr. Roishika uh, and Dr. Neha, and of course, our senior resident, Dr. Roishika, and all the residents who have come and helped. And of course, the faculty who's been a part of it, Dr. J.B. Sharma, who's been here, and all the delegates who have take their, taken their time out to join, and of course, Mr. Vishal, who's helped with all the organization and Conferences International. Thank you for joining. And of course, Krishna, you've been very special. He's the first one to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us for a cup of tea outside. <laughs> Achievement in the last 